and welcome to the City of Pasco Council's special meeting and regular workshop. The Council thanks you for being part of the City Government. At special meetings, the Council takes formal action on specific items and during the workshops, only discusses issues with no formal action taken. Agenda packets are available on the City of Pasco's website at www.pasco-wa.gov slash agenda. This meeting is being televised live on PSC TV channel 191 on Spectrum Cable in Pasco and Richland and is streamed on the city's Facebook page, website, YouTube channel, and GoToWebinar. This and previous council meeting video is available on the city's website. Lastly, the public may submit their comments and or questions by contacting the city manager, city clerk, or by using the Ask Pasco app. And with that, can I get roll call please? Council members Brown? Present. Campos? Present. Milne? Here. Roach? Present. Serrano? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Maloney? Present. And Mayor Barajas? Present. And with that, would you please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Thank you for joining me on the Pledge of Allegiance. We do have uh, item four, new business appointment of interim city manager effective November 1st, 2022. Can I get a motion? Is there any introduction comments or are we just straight to the motion? Uh, if I could, um, not a lot of introduction other than, as council is well aware, I'm, my, my, I'm closing up my time here and uh, the, the city needs a appointed city manager to carry out the duties of the city. Uh, it can't be acting, it has to be interim. Yeah, so he'll have the statutory duties that I do right now and the same type of authority. Uh, it'll be effective November 1st uh, at the stroke of midnight, uh, just as I'm no longer effective so <laughs> but uh it's uh proud for me to be able to uh to uh, announce uh deputy city manager uh, adam lincoln uh, and recommend him for this and i appreciate the council support in that uh, adam has been here just a little bit over two years now uh, and has demonstrated uh, a real passion for the city and uh a passion for the work and uh, I think you'll be in very good hands and I would recommend approval thank you all right with that I move to appoint city city of Pasco deputy city manager Adam Lincoln as interim city manager effective November 1st 2022 and remain as the interim city manager until such time as the city manager is hired by the Pasco City Council and is sworn in and with that second Thank you. There's a motion. There's a second by Council Member uh, Campos. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. You're lucky, no opposition. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And with that, um, interim city manager Adam Lincoln, I do have an oath that I will read out. Um, do you have to stand Actually, yes. Right do you want to stand in front? Or do you want to stay up here? I will stay up here. All right. So he raises his hand, right? You should raise your hand. Yes, ma'am. I. I, Adam Lincoln. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. And the Constitution and laws of the state of Washington. And the Constitution and laws of the state of Washington. And all local ordinances and all local ordinances and that I will faithfully and impartially perform and that I will faithfully and impartially perform and discharge the duties of office of city manager and discharge the duties of the office of the city manager for the city of Pasco for the city of Pasco according to the law according to the law to the best of my ability to the best of my ability and with that 
He is officially sworn in. I uh, really appreciate this opportunity and uh, look forward to working with you all in the in the interim while you conduct the search. Um, also have my wife and my daughters here today, so they were excited to see government and work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again. And with that, we'll move on to item C on our agenda resolution number 4266 to approve interim city manager contract. And we have Mr. Ferguson for some comment. Sure. <laughs> this is a, a Dave Zabel special that uh, he put me on the spot for. You want to take it? Yeah, I, I can take it. Uh, <laughs> My apologies. So this uh, basically um, uh, puts you in a contractual relationship with the city manager, uh, as uh, was stated in the motion. Uh, the um, uh, term of it is effective uh, stroke of midnight on November 1st and until a permanent city manager is appointed. So that could be uh, several weeks out it could be a month or two out depending on the process and and uh what that how that unfolds uh with council so staff recommends approval um the um uh salary is within the salary range uh, uh set for the position and uh the the uh, a couple other little finer points on there is uh that the um Deputy city manager's not necessarily giving up his job to be a, a interim city manage, manager. Matter of fact, he's going to probably be doing both jobs, which is a is a big, big undertaking. So he'll be extremely busy over the next several weeks. And uh, uh, in the event council does not select him or he decides he doesn't want to be selected, he has a job to go back to. So this contract provides for that as well. I, I don't think uh, the latter will be the case. You know, I. Pretty sure he's pretty invested in in the process. So uh, again, we'll see how that unfolds and recommend uh, approval. Thank you. Any questions or comments from council? Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead. I move to approve resolution number four two six six, approving the interim city manager contract. There's a motion. I'll second that. Seconded by Councilwoman Roach. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. And it passes unanimously. Congratulations. And uh, we will be going into executive session to discuss with legal counsel about current or potential litigation per RCW 42.30.1101I for 30 minutes. But we'll take a five-minute recess for Adam um, and staff to welcome him into his new position. So we'll be gone for 35 minutes. Um, to return at uh, 740, 750. Is that doable? 745. 745. We'll do 745. I'd just like to simply note that I'm abstaining from the executive session. Thank you. So I'll be out here.
It is 7.46 and we will be needing another five minutes, so we'll be returning at 7.51. Thank you.
It is now 7.52 and we are back from our executive session. Moving on to item six on our agenda, unfinished business. Item A, adoption of a draft redistricting plan for council voting districts. And our city manager is still, sorry, our city attorney is still in the meeting room. So we'll, we'll give them a, a couple seconds here. Mayor, I can provide some of the historical background while the city attorney Sounds good. Uh, Thank you. gets ready. But uh, so, as uh, council is well aware, uh, the um, city um, back in 2017 adopted a districting plan. And uh, that was a result of uh, a lot of history here, but that was a result of uh, a lot of effort on the part of the city prior to 2017 to change state law. Uh, which precluded the city from uh, adopting voting districts uh, and allowing for voting in my district in the, gen in the general election. Uh, we had districts prior to that, but uh, it was all at large uh, in, the, in the regular general election. And, you know, we're, tonight we actually have with us our, our lobbyist who worked really hard and uh, brought those bills almost to the point of getting them passed uh, for two different sessions and... Uh, at the very end, uh, had too many people jumping onto it to add, uh, add things to them, and, and we couldn't get through the finish line. Uh, the city council at that time uh, had, had been in contact uh, and working pretty closely with ACLU, our, our city attorney at the time as well, and uh, we worked out a process by which we could get into federal court and uh, work through that process. Ultimately, uh, Judge Lonnie Suko, U.S. District Court, Eastern Washington District, uh, issued a consent decree adopting the city's preferred plan, which was six uh, uh, council, city council districts and one at large districts. One at large, dist large districts. Something that we kind of learned along the way, uh, because the city had, I, I think, had done a pretty good job of trying to comply. <laughs> Uh, with the limitations on state law and uh, had been adjusting districts because they were growing so fast on a pretty regular basis. Every two or three years, we're adjusting districts. And uh, one of the things we learned under the Federal Voter Rights Act, uh, different than the rules we're using for the state, is that the uh, U.S. Census is the gold standard uh, by which to use. So we adopted a a map, as I said, the six districts back in in 2017, and uh, the numbers we had to base that map on was the 2010 census. So we roll forward a few years now, and um, of course, uh, Pasco. This was a a huge year of population growth for Pasco, annexations, uh, development, uh, commercial and retail, and. Uh, huge population uh, increase between 2010 and 2020, uh, further compounded by the fact that we were, at, during the time of the U.S. Census, uh, was about smack dab in the middle, or the beginning, I guess, of uh, a worldwide pandemic, which slowed the U.S. Census down by about six months. So a lot of that data came late. Normally, we'd have received data in April. Uh, I think we received it more along the lines of... Uh, September. And so that, uh, that kind of held up some of the analysis. Uh, that analysis has since been uh, completed. And uh, you have before you a draft um, redistricting plan that uh, takes into account uh, the growth the city's experienced since 2020, the pattern of that growth, because that it grow, you know, our, our growth doesn't all just happen equally across the entire city. Uh, we see a lot of growth out west, so it's not surprising we see some of the districts in the east stretching to the west, and some of the districts out west getting a little bit more compacted uh, than what they were before, because that's kind of where the weight of that growth had uh, occurred. And uh, with that, I think the city attorney is ready to kind of take over a little bit on 
voter age population and demographics and those type of uh, things that uh, uh, council needs to consider in, in adopting a redistricting plan. Great, thank you, Mr. Zabel. So, uh, Mr. just Ferguson, a, oh, sure. If I may, I, I want to interject here. Sure. I, I have my personal qualms with the Voting Rights Act, and this is a personal issue um, that I, I personally don't believe it's valid, nor does it comply with federal regulations. With that, I'm going to recuse myself from both hearing this and participating in that because I don't want anything that Pete Serrano does in Pete Serrano's day job to impact what's done here at the city. So, with that, if it's appropriate, I'd like to recuse myself until this action is taken. And I guess when you adjourn, call me back in. I'll be back in the office. Thank you. Real quick, Pete. I want to thank you for that, man. That's not an easy thing to do and uh, shows your ethical background. And um, I, for one, respect that. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm going to take my water. Okay, with that, um, the, uh, the, the one of the things I just want to uh, kind of back up a little bit, it, we, we have a very unique situation, uh, and I know I say that a lot, and, and uh, it seems like uh, every time I, I, I start talking about something, it, it, because we do, we have a lot of very unique situations, and this is probably the, the biggest of all. Uh, we have the federal liti uh, litigation that uh, Mr. Zabel just recently uh, discussed, uh, and that really... Um, makes uh, makes this process different for the city of Pasco than it does for other jurisdictions. And what I mean by that is uh, the current uh, statute that we're trying to comply with is RCW 29A76010, which is uh, the redistricting requirement. Uh, it's actually uh, not, not included in the Washington Voter Rights Act, uh, but it's actually a separate portion in the same uh, title and chapter. So, uh, but essentially what it says is that all uh, it basically made a state law that uh, required all jurisdictions uh, to that that uh, were divided by, by districts, including special purpose districts, uh, which include school districts and other um, other municipalities that um, had to go through this redistricting process with using the 2020 uh, decennial census data. So we have that requirement on over here, but we also have the litigation process that we went through to even actually be able to force our way into districts because under the state law at the time, no longer is the case now, but under the state law at the time, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't move to districts. So uh, it, is a, it is a very complicated issue because we have that process and we have our districts were approved by the federal court, uh, by Judge Succo, as mentioned by Mr. Zabel. Uh, so that was that process. Uh, we had to, that's how now we're trying to then apply this uh, to that previous map that we received from Judge Succo. So with that, um, I'm not, uh, I, the, the map is what it is. I mean, there's obviously been a lot of data. We've gone through, um, we've uh, started this process knowing this uh, federal or this uh, state legislation uh, wasn't going to be in effect. Uh, we started this process in mid-2021 uh, and now are going through the next stages. Uh, the next step that we'll have to do is, uh, now this map uh, will be published. Uh, we have to, then within 10 days, have a public meeting or public uh, opportunity for public to comment on it. And then after that, we have to, uh, uh, within, if we make any changes based on that public comment, then we have to have at least seven days after that before we can take, we can adopt this map as our actual plan to comply with the statute. Sorry, go ahead. So ju yeah, just to be clear, it's the, the 10 days is within 10 days of publication. So we have to be a little bit careful about official publication. So we, yeah, we, we don't find ourselves past the 10 days by the time you have your next city council meeting two weeks out from now. <clears throat> Okay, thank you for that. Do we have any comment from council? Mayor Pertambaloni. Thank you, Mayor Barajas. So if I understand correctly, uh, Mr. Ferguson, what we have up on the screen is intended to be published, but not quite yet. And that timeline is due to specific laws that are preventing us from publishing it officially right now. So this is an unofficial peek at what we plan on doing. That's correct. This would be the, uh, this is obviously open to the public and so the public has access to it. So it's not confidential in any way, but it has not been published yet. That would require um, obviously going through the newspaper and then obviously the websites, uh, other, other avenues that the city uses to uh, make sure that that, uh, that data and the, this map as well as the proposed plan is actually accessible to the public for an extended period of time as, as much as can be allowed under the statute. But it's a, it's a pretty, uh, expedited statute that requires very 
small window on the front end and then a, an even smaller window on the back end for adoption. Um, and my, my other question along those lines is the data that supports this redistricting plan that will be published with the map or that is ours or is that confidential information? Uh, can, you, can you explain the, the underpinnings of this in terms of voter age population, et cetera, that was being used to, um, to create this map? So the proposed plan will include uh, all of this. Uh, there, uh, the numbers that that these districts that make up these this map, uh, that data uh, will will be part of what's published. Uh, so that's what you're adopting tonight is that uh, the data that we've gone over. Uh, but at this point, uh, it needs to be finalized so that it can it can be published uh, and put in that format. So I, I, I'm very interested in making sure that we have more opportunities for the public to weigh in than our one meeting on the 7th, which will put us in a very tight window where basically no changes will be able to be made. Um, so I'd be very interested in as if we can set up a series of listening sessions or a, at least at least one virtual listening session, some opportunity for folks to understand the underpinnings outside of the um, November 7th meeting where it's not necessarily a quorum of the council and certainly not an official council meeting. Um, I'd be very, very, very supportive, we'll say, of, of having some opportunity for those those concerns to be heard. Well, we may have some amount of time to adjust, um, the seventh will be too late. So just so we're clear, the statute does not prohibit uh, an additional meeting. It just says that you have to have at least one meeting within, ta within 10 days of being published. So um, I don't see anything in the statute that would prevent an additional meeting. Uh, uh, quite frankly, the opposite is true because it, uh, the statute says that uh, uh, each jurisdiction uh, shall ensure that full and reasonable public notice of its actions is provided. So uh, with a general uh, assertion like that, um, any, anything in addition to that, uh, quite frankly, I would be shocked if uh, it was looked on uh, as contrary. Great. As, as part of that is, I think, the uh, November 7th meeting, I'd like that to be as to the point um, as possible without a lot of regurgitation of the facts and data that have already been presented out to the public. So as if we can minimize that by using this listening session or, or whatever else we'd like to set up, that would be appreciated. Um, and the only other thing to say is, um, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm super disappointed that this is the first opportunity that the public's getting an opportunity to see this. And I'm, I'm not pointing my fingers at anybody, but this is, this is, this is very, very frustrating to me that here we are, end of October, and this is the first time that the public gets to see this map here, or even a discussion, or even the fact that we were looking at redistricting has been very, very quiet. Um, that, that, is, that, is, that is horribly offensive to me as a person, and as someone who pays a lot of attention to redistricting, um, this is a very short window. So I would encourage anyone listening and watching, um, this is really important. This is the sort of things that define who we're going to be for the next decade. And I would really encourage anyone who has concerns, objections, wants to know more data, understand this better, please weigh in. If you know of someone who is of special interest to this sort of, this sort of information, please reach out to them and ask them to weigh in. Um, I know I will be personally doing so. We have a number of concerned, concerned constituents that, you know, they're, they get busy. And so I'll be reaching out to, to a number of people to make sure they have an opportunity to weigh in on the process if they see fit. We're in a really expedited time frame to meet state law. Um, it's unfortunate. I don't want to be here. No, no one on council, I think, wants to be here. Um, but we're going to move forward as expeditiously as we can to comply with state law. Um, that's, I, so please, get your comments, questions, concerns in as soon as possible so we can try to be responsive and at least provide you the information you're looking for. That's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, do you have some uh, just a Just a couple more uh, comments. You know, so we, we do have the map up there. As the city attorney said, we'll be able to provide uh, uh, within just a few days the uh, uh, backup for that. And, uh, you know, that analysis was done by a person named Dr. Peter Morrison. He's a demographer we worked with uh, back in 2016 and 2017 to develop those maps as well. So he's very familiar with, with PASCO. At that point in time, he was able to create... Um, two Hispanic uh, voter age uh, population majority districts and one called an opportunity district it was right around that 50 percent uh, mark and uh, even in spite of the amount of growth we've had and the pattern in which that growth occurred uh, uh, and as I mentioned earlier at the onset of my comments we can kind of see those districts are getting a little stretched out 
uh, or excuse me, they, they kind of migrated a little west to, to, to meet that population. Uh, we still are able to maintain uh, the two uh, uh, Hispanic uh, voter age population majority districts as well as uh, an opportunity district uh, over 50 percent. So it's not, not much over 50 percent, but it is over 50 percent. Um, yeah, and I, I would just share with the public, you know, you, we, you, you look at a map like that and you, and you see that, uh, you know, a jagged line here or these awkward shapes and so forth. Uh, the goal the demographer had in trying to put that together and what the council is trying to uh, uh, maintain here and, and achieve is the highest concentration of those populations, particularly in those three districts. Uh, you get out into the, the other districts, uh, uh, the three, four, and five, and those are 25% uh, Hispanic population, 75% non-Hispanic. So it, you start to delve out into there and try to square off lines and things like that, you, you start to go backwards in uh, the objective here. And uh, I'll share that with you. And then one other piece too, is we, we've uh, since that map, that's the, that's, that's the city limit map as it occurred back in 2021, excuse me, April of 2021. Excuse me, April of 2020. And uh, all obviously we've had a, some annexation since then. Uh, once this map is adopted, uh, there'll be another, uh, I guess a round of uh, effort by the, by the part of staff and, and uh, council to add those areas in. Uh, to the right district. Some of the some of the district boundaries may have changed or whatever and so our, our next job is going to make sure to you know council designated those annex newly annexed areas uh, based on the the current um, district map and so we're going to have to make sure that those are areas are contiguous to their to the new districts. And so you'll you'll see some effort happen in probably November or December uh, around that around that issue. So they wanted to make sure council was aware of that too, because that is not our city limit map today, but we have to, in, in doing this exercise, we, we kind of need to think about things as on the day, on the 10 year anniversary between April 20th, 2010 and April, or excuse me, April 1st, 2010 and April 1st, 2020, that's what it looked like. And that's what the boundaries should be. We all recognize we've had population growth since then. That's, this is what the law says decennial census. Thank you. Comment from Councilmember uh, Milne. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to echo Councilman Maloney's comments. Um, I just know the, the time frame, it looks bad. Again, I'd love to have given more time to our different constituents. Um, to me, it's also frustrating. Um, and then on a side note, very frustrating to lose the Riverview District. I know there's a lot of constituents that I'm very good friends with and felt like I represented that area very well at a connection with a lot of people, so losing it uh, is hard to take, but uh, I'm also willing to accept what it is and uh, move forward and uh, yeah, just wish the best. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? For me, uh, Mayor, and I would just like to say that uh, even though <clears throat> I don't have a district, I, I do belong to Councilmember Serrano's district, but I represent you know, the, the whole city at large, I fielded, fielded a lot of comments um, and inquiries about this particular item and the lack of time that we've given to the public and even been asked about what our priorities are as a council if we're giving more oxygen to retail cannabis than we are to redistricting. Um, which I would have to say I'm in agreement at those residents' comments. Um, mm -hmm because I do think your voting right is more important than retail cannabis. Um, and, you know, we're going to try to do our best in having that listening session, having the November 7th. So just to reiterate what was already said, that it's important to hear um, your input. I, I think it's invaluable to have residents share their perspective because they see things and they understand things in ways that we don't have that same perspective. So. Um, it informs our decision, um, and I appreciate it. So I guess I'll wrap my comments up there. But I, I hope that we have good turnout, and, you know, we're going to try to get at least a couple, uh, couple times where we can get public comment in. 
Thank you for your comments. Any further questions or comments? Hearing none. Can I get a motion? All right, Mayor, I'm going to try to make a motion. The uh, um, Our attorney did suggest some slight change, tweak to the language, so I'm looking at him real hard right now and hoping he's uh, ready to help advise me if I miss. All right, I move to approve the draft redistricting plan for the Pas Pasco City Council voting districts as presented um, to council by staff and authorized publication uh, for public comment consistent with the state and federal voting rights acts. Ms. Ferguson, did I get that right? Thank you. There's a motion. I'll second that. I'll second it by Councilwoman Roach. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. And it passes unanimously. Councilmember Sarno. So we'll give them a couple seconds, a few seconds. So, to get Mayor, we'll, we'll work to schedule a um, public uh, informational meeting prior to November 7th. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to item B on our agenda, resolution number 4262, appointment process for city boards and commissions. And we have our um, city clerk, Ms. Deborah. Thank you. Um, so at the last meeting, um, Mr. Serrano had asked for some changes to be made, and we made those, and they're in your packet, and hopefully that's good enough um, in terms of the qualifications. So. If you're good with that, we can go ahead and make a motion. No further questions or comments? I'm good. From council? Can I get a motion? All right, I move to approve resolution number 4262, amending the process for appointments to city boards and commissions. There's a motion. Can I get a second? Second. Second. Oh. Seconded by One Councilman uh, uh, Serrano. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. So with that, we are finished with our um, special meeting. We will move on to our uh, regular workshop meeting. However, I am being pressured into taking a five minute break. So we'll take a five minute break to return at um, 8.20.
it is 821 and we're back from our little recess. So we will uh, move on to our regular workshop meeting and having gone through um, roll call, Pledge of Allegiance and all the housekeeping, we will move on to item four on our workshop meeting um, agenda, verbal reports from council members. Do we have any reports from council members? Um, Councilman Milne. Thank you, Mayor. On um, this last Friday, I got to attend a grand opening of h &R Elite Trucking Academy in uh, East Pasco there. And I can say what a great group of guys, very welcoming. Um, they put together a really cool uh, academy as far as for truck drivers. And uh, I can't say enough about the owner, uh, Juan Rojas. He was, uh, again, made me feel like I was part of the family and got a little tour of his facility. And I think it's going to be a huge boost for Pasco as far as um, also was next to Saul's place as well. It just, we need truck drivers. And again, how they ran their outfit, it was one of the nicest facilities I've seen as far as anything to do with trucking. It was just very nice. And uh, again, I can't say enough about how nice the guy was. And then today I got to fill in for our mayor at uh, Jersey Mike's. And so I got to eat some of their great food. <laughs> As uh, Councilman Campos always said, I always like food. Um, but it was very good. And uh, the owner, uh, Tim Kleinfelter, he did give everybody uh, a ticket to go eat some of his subs, which I did pass out. And uh, again, another business that's sorely needed in Pasco. I think, uh, yeah, it's you could always use good finery, good eat fineries in uh, Pasco, and uh, I'm glad they're here, and I'm glad uh, glad we have such uh, good establishments. Thank that you, thank you for sharing that, and you were in the right place at the right time. <laughs> Councilwoman Roach, and then Councilman Campos. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a set so that Councilmember Brown can do a spike. Um, on Saturday was the first ever um, African American Chamber of Commerce uh, initial kickoff meeting, and so I wanted to make sure that he spoke about that and shared how it went. I will jump in. Um, I was on phones and text messages. I was not there in person because there was other things um, going on, but. Let me tell you what an exciting event that that was. Just through the telephone, I felt like I was there, um, that I was a part of what was going on. And it, I was told it was definitely something I can identify with. So I missed in person a great event, but um, it was successful. Um, and there's greater things to come. Um, community wise, um, this program is going to um, become crucial. Um, to what we look at as far as diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it's going to definitely be a caveat to what we already have in place in the city of Pasco, and I welcome it as it is a, a, a baby right now, but it's going to grow up to be something spectacular. So thanks to Councilman Roach for getting that out there, and to um, Shawnee Fitzgerald, actually, who headed this, um, is just doing excellent work within the community so i just want to make sure i mention her name and her um program women of wisdom is just doing some awesome work so hats off to shawnee fitzgerald and the wisdom women of wisdom who is doing a great work so again thank you and i'm proud to be connected to it and soon a part of it thank you councilman Campos. thank you madam mayor i i uh, was in attendance of the Good Roads meeting on uh, Wednesday last week virtually, and I was able to watch uh, Director Worley and Maria Sarah give really good presentations. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Director Worley, but we got some recognition from our other municipalities, and we made the list. So that's all. Thank you, Thank you for sharing that, Mayor Patamaloni. My comment is not going to be near as exciting as anything that was just said, so I'm feeling sad about that. But um, we had a, we've been working on the boards and commissions. Um, now that we have the the past um, resolution that we, we just passed a little bit ago about how we're going to structure our boards and commissions committee reviews. Um, we are moving. You know, we're going to be able to move forward really rapidly on getting people appointed to those boards. Um, if you know of someone who is interested in civic uh, responsibility and engaging in our community. 
please have them apply. Um, these boards and commissions, we're not just looking for someone who has like a depth of knowledge. We're looking for people who have love for community. We want diverse representation on these boards, and that means all sorts of different, different types of diversity that we want to see. Um, we want to see diverse points of view when it comes to making, helping us make decisions as a council. So, um, yeah, please, please make sure you, um, you apply if you get an opportunity. Thank you. And I did also remember that on Wednesday, I attended the Tri-City Regional uh, Chamber, and we got to hear our mayor speak about the health of the city, and uh, I thought she did a good job. It was uh, good to hear the different four cities give a report, and I'll let her take it away, but uh, overall, it was, a, it, was a good, it was a good speech. It was, it was good, and I was just going to, you know, swim right through that one. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I think it went well. Um, it was a presentation by all four cities. Um, very informative, um, and just really sharing about the development, the growth, and everything that's coming to Pasco. So it's very exciting to share that and, and brag, really, brag about what Pasco is doing. Um, the growth that we're um, seeing, and and how we're addressing and inviting new business into our community. So it was very exciting. I was very nervous because, as you know, I do not like to speak in public, as I'm doing now. <laughs> Anyways, uh, thank you again for being present. Um, city manager was there as well. Really, a lot of the staff here tonight was there. Uh, great event. Moving on to, um, on our agenda, item five, items for discussion. Item A, visit Tri-Cities 2022 Mid-Year Report and Tri-City Regional Hotel Motel Commission 2023 Marketing Plan and Budget. City Manager, do you have any comments, Adam? Thanks, Mayor and Council. Just want to introduce uh, Kim Shugart and uh, Board President Corey Pearson, who are both here tonight to talk a little bit about the mid-year update as well as talk a little bit about the, uh, the budget process and, and where they're at as an organization. So thank you for being here. Yeah, good evening. Again, Kim Shugart, if you can press the button for the light, red light to come on. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Kim Shugart. I'm the Senior Vice President with Visit Tri-Cities, um, and I actually have a, a cheering session, not quite as big as Adam's cheering sec section, but they did stay up late, so I'm going to give them props for that. Corey Pearson is our Chairman of Visit Tri-Cities, um, and, and then Jerry Beach is with A1 Hospitality, and he does have two hotels here in Pasco. So um, I'm going to go through this information pretty quickly. Um, there's two different items that I'd like to present to you. One is our mid-year report. That's our deliverables to you as the city we're a destination marketing organization i want to let you know a little bit about what we've done to promote tourism and visitor spending in in the cities and then we'll go over the regional uh, tpa commission that's the proceeds from the three dollars per room that is charged on each guest room and how we spend that and invest that so So the minute you report, a lot of the things that we do are done through committees, through Visit Tri-Cities, and we have a number of them. We have the Hotel and Directors of Sales. That's where we work with the hospitality industry um, to promote either conventions or sports. Um, we also work on initiatives together and support those businesses. We also have the, the Hotel Motel Commission. I'm going to go over that in, in a little bit, so I will touch on that briefly. Then we have the Wine Tourism Council. Um, we have a healthy wine industry, and it brings people in from all around the country and actually all around the world. Um, and we work with them to market at our products and, and to entice people to come here. We also have the National Park uh, Committee, which supports the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. And we have this Tri-City Sports Council, um, which really works to bring different sporting events into the Tri-Cities. And then the River Shore Enhance Enhancement Council, as well as the Heritage Foundation. Um, just to give you a brief um, update of how we were doing as we got to the mid-year, um, we've actually recovered pretty well. The pandemic obviously was catastrophic for the hospitality industry, um, but since uh, if you compare to where we were in 19, which was a record year, and then of course 20 and 21 were very difficult, we're actually up 6.6 .6 million to 2019, um, which is 15 percent as far as the revenues that the hotels received through the first six months of this year compared to 2019. 
Um, there's a number of things that we've been working on for tourism development. Um, Banduango passes are something that we introduced early this year. What those are, those are consumer passes that um, people can come over, whether it's a wine pass or a family fun pass, they purchase them um, and encourages them to spend money in our local businesses. And that's been very successful. We also launched a number of digital kiosks. Those are like a touch screen kiosk. We have uh, one at the Tri-City Airport. We have one at the Convention Center. We have one that's mobile that we can take along with us to shows and trade shows. Um, and then additionally, we have a large one in our um, visitor center over in Kennewick. The other thing we worked on very hard over the first six months of the year was the Travel Bloggers Exchange in North America, TBEX. Um, and you may have heard or learned of this because PASCO hosted the closing reception. This event attracted 270 different social media and bloggers um, who went out and wrote a number of stories. When I go over the deliverables for the marketing department, I'll come back and visit on this quickly. Um, if you look at our deliverables, uh, this is a lot of information here, but really what I want you to take away is that we uh, generated 84 leads for our hoteliers and our businesses to bring in conventions for the future. We did that in the first six months of the year. Conventions have been very slow to come back because they are gatherings of large people. The leisure travel has come back a little bit quicker, um, but we were in the first six months able to generate 84 leads. Also, we were able to host 85 conventions or sporting events. Um, on a typical year, if it was pre-pandemic, we would host about 200 events a year. So we're pacing pretty well to where we were um, pre-pandemic. Uh, marketing and communications. Um, this is where you see the effects of TBEX. If you look in that upper right-hand corner, we've had uh, 51 positive stories, but that number of impressions is 3.7 billion, I believe. That's the kind of influence that those travel bloggers are. Normally that number would not, in a regular year, would not be that high, but it's because of the impressions and the following that those travel bloggers have. Um, I'm going to just go on to the hotel, motel commission, their budget and marketing plan, and then take any uh, questions at the end of my presentation. <clears throat> the tourism promotion assessment for Visit Tri-Cities funds about almost 70% of our organization. Um, again, that's at $3 per room. Uh, the hoteliers voted that assessment in, and they can also vote it out. Um, it covers a lot of our um, expenditures, convention and sports marketing, digital advertising, social media advertising, broadcast advertising, our website, our trade shows, our opportunity fund grants. Um, so it was really, when it was established in 2004, um, was, was quite a um, boon to our organization and allowed us to grow to the point that we are today. Um, the way the commission is made up, there's two hoteliers from each of the three cities. Uh, Jerry Beach is one of our commissioners for PASCO, um, as is Monica Hammerberg with the Hampton Inn. And then Dave is an ex officio. Dave Zabel is an ex officio for us. In the deliverables under the uh, mid-year report, we talked about how we've performed for the first um, half of the year. These numbers talk about what we expect for the future. Um, as you can see, um, as far as ADR, RevPAR, and uh, what, what we're expecting for 2022 versus 2023, there's just that continued growth. And it'll take 2000, until 2024 until we actually um, see significant growth over where we were in 2019. <clears throat> This talks about our goals. Um, we always want to stretch ourselves. It talks about, it's uh, based in room nights, um, but as you can see, um, we expect this year we're going to book 37,000 room nights. Next year we're going to book uh, 45,000. So again, we're starting to recover on some of those group. And then it also talks about the leads. This year we're going to issue 180 leads. Um, next year we're going to issue 230. So we're really starting to ramp up. And we've hired the staff to help accommodate that as well. Meetings and conventions, really the takeaway here, this is how we spend the money on these different programs. Um, they're listed there for the different things, advertising, trade shows, and membership. Um, I think something that might be of interest to you is the estimated direct hotel spending at $2.6 million um, for just conventions. That's not sports, that's just conventions um, because that's hotel and lodging taxes. Um, and, and that's really a lot of programs are funded not only for Visit Tri-Cities, but through the city for, for some of your programs. Uh, for sports tournaments, we're going to book 25,000 rooms, and that's going to create a direct hotel spending of $3.125 million. The economic impact is also important because it's not just about hotels. It's about our small businesses, our hospitality industry. 
uh, tourism development. In addition, the TPA supporters spent over uh, $500,000 in advertising. That's just out of the TPA budget. We also have a budget that comes from hotel and lodging tax and our membership. So all told, it'll be about uh, $600,000 we'll spend in advertising. This slide speaks to our funding comparative. As you look at other destination marketing organizations throughout the region, again, we have three sources of funding. We've got the tourism promotion assessment, which is really what this budget's about. We also receive money from the city for hotel and lodging taxes. We have a five-year marketing contract with you. And then we also have membership. And when you look at the different sources of funding, um, we, we rank about in the middle. And given the size of our community, we're very appropriately funded. But certainly, when you start throwing around some of these numbers, like five or $600,000 for advertising, people go, wow, yeah, that's a lot of money. Really, it's comparative as you look at other destination marketing organizations. For our community, our size, we're appropriately funded. That concludes my report. It was fast. It was furious. I know you guys have been real busy tonight. So um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for... A very fast and very furious <laughs> presentation there uh, in consideration of how late we are. Do we have any questions? Uh, Councilman Campos. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Kim, for the presentation. I typically wouldn't ask questions on this, but you had a couple uh, things that are interesting to me. So, Ban Wango, that sounds a little bit like Seattle City Pass. Seattle had done that for years, I think 10, 15 years ago, and it kind of went by the wayside. Is that correct? That's about the same same process. You're engaging wine tourism, your specific packages for these things. Is that how that works? Yeah, I'm not familiar with theirs, but I'll tell you the way that ours works is we work with this company. They go out and work with our partners, whether it might be a wine pass, and then they work with the wineries. Um, they put together the package and then they offer it. Um, it. It might be a family fun pass. That's another one that we've offered. There's two ways you can do the pass. You can do them as a paid pass um, where the consumer pays, but there's a savings in it for them. Um, or you can even do free passes and the one the passes that we had done um, first just to introduce those to our partners were free passes and it just encouraged people to spend their money with Perfect. the that local sounds, businesses. sounds pretty close I remember Seattle City Pass was real neat you paid like 250 bucks but it got free admission into like the EMP uh, the aerospace museum like five different things it had a list of like seven or eight that you could choose from but you could only do five uh, which was interesting um, have I asked this question uh, to your last director, and I don't know if it was Michael. Michael, yeah. um, you know, we are growing not just in our wine industry, but beer tourism is becoming mm -hmm. a thing. Have you guys started exploring that? Yeah, so one of the things with the Band Wangle Pass we did was called Ales and Tales, and it was promoting. Um, uh, craft beverages that places that had that were dog friendly there are quite a few of them um, throughout the tri cities the other thing we've talked about doing is an ale trail or an ale pass um, and really it's working with the businesses that offer those products and make sure that they're willing to support it in certain times sometimes we need to remind them that they don't have to offer something that's available all the time that they can kind of fence it if you will maybe they only often offer it at certain times when they want to drive business um, so we're still kind of in the educating our um, user phase of the Van Wango Pass. Got it. Okay. Um, and then the last thing, I think this kind of goes with what Councilman Milne had said earlier. You know, the numbers that you're putting out are showing that we are putting forward quality eating establishments and our hospitality industry is booming. And uh, thank you for providing an update on that. It's nice to see that we're doing some things. So. Thank you. Thank you. Comments from Mayor Pertemaloni. Thank you, and thank you, Kim. Always a pleasure. Um, so I, my question is is very specific, and I think it's more leading towards a future conversation I'd like to have. Um, I'd like to understand um, very much your 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 trends and what your projections are for the Hapo Center. Um, as we know right now, that facility is in some amount of transition, um, and obviously it is one of the uh, major convention centers in our our area. So I'd be very interested as we're we're trying to. Um, understand and forge that path forward, um, what information you can help us provide to help um, make sure that we're understanding and taking into account the whole picture. So. Um, we have a number of records that I can share with you. I don't have the exact numbers, but we, um, we, we track a number of things. We track uh, lost business reports. We track the leads that we issue to each of the facilities and whether they respond or not. Um, there's a, just a number of uh, metrics that we can provide you with as it relates to our relation, long-term relationship with that. Um, Fantastic. So I want to ask you to try to speculate right now, but I'd love to have a follow-up conversation in uh, the next couple of weeks. Great. Thank you. Any 
further questions or comments? Uh, Councilman Campos. Sorry, Serrano. Thank you. <laughs> um, is, is there any particular, uh, you know, Councilman Maloney hit on HAPO. Is there any particular industry, event, or anything that's not necessarily rebounded from COVID that we as a city could assist you in promoting? Or, um, you know, I see Mr. Beach might have nodded his head just because he does that. Or <laughs> if there's something specific, I mean, I think this is feedback that would benefit us. Of like, you know, you haven't, uh, we partnered with the Dust Devils, made improvements there. And I think that's rendering some type of benefit to everybody but is there something that's missing or that it was co pre-covid strong and hasn't rebounded where we could do something as a city and say we want to invest in people coming here so i will give you a two-part answer the first part is in 2019 we completed the regional sports marketing feasibility study and um, city staff city council has taken that to heart and made those investments so really you're doing those things as as we're outlined in the sports feasibility and um, you know when we look at each of the communities and then you look at that study different things were recommended for each community and that was on purpose we don't want to duplicate efforts we want to market things as if you're outside the tri-cities we're one location um, when we're inside we understand that where the boundaries are um, but we want to make sure that things are complementary so that some of the projects that you are currently working on support that the second part of that is meetings and conventions are the slowest to come back. Um, and, but in the last, even just the last three months, we've really started to issue a large number of requests for proposals and leads because finally those meeting planners are starting to step up. Um, kind of as you talk about the HAPO Center and it's, you know, it, it's a very large space and we need large spaces because um, that affects everybody. That affects that whole Road 68. It affects not just one hotel, but multiple hotels and businesses. And so it's looking as Councilman Maloney said, um, how do we best uh, utilize that asset um, for the benefit of tourism and then visitor spending? Okay. Appreciate that and hopefully we can dovetail those two questions together and then again if if you mr beach or anyone else on the board has any specific input in uh where either facilities are lacking or something man this was really strong in 19 and and we've just forgotten please let us know i mean because this is about making sure that people are coming here they're staying they're bringing tax revenue in from outside and i <coughs> love nothing better than to receive money that doesn't belong here until it comes here thank you Yep, they come in, they drop their money, they go home. It's great. <laughs> We're in the import money business. Uh, Chief Roski didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any further questions or comments? Thank you again um, for your presentation. This, thank this thank you very much. Moving, lo moving along to our next item on the agenda is uh, item B, presentation of 2023 legislative priorities <coughs> our um deputy city manager thank you mayor and council we've got brianna murray here uh who's with lord thomas honeywell she's your lobbyist uh, she's been working hard with uh, staff to put together a, a draft agenda for you uh, i think you'll you'll see that it takes a lot of parts from uh, awc priorities past priorities current priorities um, and also mentioned that we'll be working on uh, setting up a time with the legislators uh, in the not so distant future to go over the the plan once it's adopted so thanks for being here Brianna. great yes thank you and before i dive in i also want to recognize um, my colleague holly kochi who assists me in advocating for the city uh, you just have me tonight she is listening in uh at, i know she's listening in because she was commenting on the late hour and in light of that i am going to try and go quickly through uh the slides um, we're going to go over um, what to expect during the 2023 legislative session, review a draft 2023 legislative agenda, and then talk about next steps. Diving right in on what to expect for the 2023 legislative session, I'll start with a reminder to you all that the legislature operates on a two-year cycle. The 2023 session will be the first year of the two-year cycle and as such is scheduled to last 105 days. It will start on January 9th and then go for uh, 105 consecutive calendar days following that. 
The major tasks before the 2023 legislature are twofold. The first is that they will de develop their 2023-25 operating capital and transportation budgets. The highlight there is we're not expecting any budget cuts. Um, there's ample revenue in all three of those budgets. And second, they will consider and adopt policy bills. We usually see a few thousand bills introduced and a few hundred pass into law. For political context, the upcoming November elections will be formative. However, if the August primary results are any indicator, Democrats are likely to maintain the majority in both the House of Representatives and the State Senate. Of course, they're not always uh, an indicator, so we'll be anxiously awaiting those November election results. Regardless of the political makeup, we are anticipating over 25 new legislators as a result of many legislators choosing to not run for re-election. So we'll, there will be many new faces in Olympia when they do convene. Following the November elections, the, each of the legislative caucuses will meet and they will identify their respective leadership, uh, committee chairs, uh, and committee assignments. We will have that information at the end of November and early December. And I will note of those 25 plus new legislators, many of them are in this region. Uh, so we have many new legislators to get to know um, and to uh, introduce to the legislative agenda and our activities in Olympia. Moving right along to your draft legislative agenda, I want to start with talking about the structure for the draft legislative agenda that we've used for several years and has been quite successful. Um, we always have a challenge in balancing the need to advance PASCO specific issues, as well as wanting to weigh in on the hundreds of bills that impact city business, positively and negatively, and wanting to be a good partner to the Association of Washington Cities. I will note that Mayor Pro Tem um, Maloney did participate in AWC's Legislative Priorities Committee, and many of those subjects are covered uh, in the draft legislative agenda. However, we tend to focus out the issues that are specific to the city of Pasco through a top priority sheet and then cover additional items in a support and oppose sheet. What that means is that when we brief our legislators, uh, we spend the bulk of our time and energy reviewing the top priorities. But as I am working with city staff to review the many different bills that come forward and engage our level of participation in legislative priorities, I use that additional support oppose list as guidance. So the top priority list that is in the draft agenda in your packet includes uh, the following items on the screen, and we're going to go through each of these in turn. Um, I will note that uh, these should not be new to you. You have seen several of these items previously in correspondence from me, uh, and um, I will also note that there is an emphasis or a priority given to the funding requests, um, particularly in the capital budget. So the first item on the legislative draft legislative agenda is a capital budget request for seven hundred and fifty thousand for uh, the North Plaza in downtown Pasco. Um, this funding request, uh, if appropriated, would build on previous investments into the farmers market, and would facilitate further economic growth and development in downtown. The second item on the draft agenda is a $5 million capital funding request for the process water reuse facility. Uh, $5 million is really a drop in the bucket when it comes to the overall costs for this facility, but it will be a public-private partnership. As we message this facility uh, and the need for the funding, we will focus on environmentally sustainable components, which we think will uh, resonate well with the Olympia environment. The next, is, the next item is, uh, and I've I'm going to get it wrong. Holly's going to just kick me for it later. Giza Stadium. Giza Stadium. See, I knew I was going to get it wrong. Um, I, it, uh, the statement on the draft legislative agenda has PASCO joining 11 communities across the state to ask for a total of $24 million to be invested into publicly owned minor league baseball stadiums that also support economic development um, within their communities. If that full $24 million were awarded, um, PASCO would receive $3 million. If less than $24 million is awarded, then the amount would go down proportionately for all of the minor league baseball stadiums in the state. So this is really a statement of us supporting a larger coalition effort. 
The next item on the draft legislative agenda is around housing. I will note that AWC has been holding a housing solutions work group this interim and uh, Deputy City Manager Adam Lincoln has been participating in that work. Um, it has been rather time intensive, but the goal and, and hope of that work group is that they will be making recommendations on specific items that cities, including PASCO, can support to advance increased housing availability and affordability. The statement on the agenda calls out some specific items that came up through the AWC Legislative Priorities Committee process. First, a recognition that PASCO has really led the way in this state by amending its zoning code to increase density, but also recognizing that there are barriers that remain to the construction of housing, including the state's current liability laws around uh, develop for developers of condominiums, um, and in increasing construction costs associated with building code requirements, and also looking at incentives to reduce these barriers or reduce costs to housing developers. The next item on the draft legislative agenda is a statement in support of public safety and behavioral health. Uh, this really is reflective of several of the items that the city of Pasco has been working on and in alignment with AWC's priorities. In particular, there's a request for operating funds for the Tri-Cities Regional Basic Law Enforcement Academy, um, which is unique to Pasco but would provide a regional benefit. Uh, and then also a statement in support of increased treatment and crisis response, a call on the legislature to revisit its policies around possession of controlled substances, and to call on the legislature to revisit their policies on vehicular pursuits. The final item uh, that's a top priority item is really a statement in support of many different funding requests in the transportation arena. As you all will recall, last legislative session, the legislature adopted the Move Ahead Washington transportation package, and it did not include any specific earmarks um, or funding for PASCO, the PASCO community. Um, we're continuing to beat the drum on the need for funding for those specific projects that we requested funding for. Uh, however, I, I do want to be realistic and highlight for you all that we're not anticipating there to be significant transportation funding available. Um, that is why it is not at the top of the list of your legislative agenda and more toward the bottom. With that being said, I, I think it's really important to continue to highlight the needs and we have some local legislators that are very enthusiastic to uh, elevate these issues on our behalf. Uh, and I and I've worked with city staff, or really city staff has done all the work of preparing a uh, document that highlights each of these projects in turn. The support opposed list is fairly lengthy, but I would just call out a few items um, that have been there for um, several years now and continue to be items that we will continue. Uh, continue to monitor and follow. The first is ensuring that we have adequate state shared revenues fully funded in the state budget, um, monitoring any of the state action on the lower Snake River dams, uh, pushing for full funding for the public works assistance account, monitoring uh, any changes through the Growth Management Act, and pushing for policies that support increased water rates for the city. So with that, um, that concludes the summary of the draft legislative agenda. In November, we will be meeting with legislators and the legislative session begins on January 9th. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, take any comments. And I will note, I forgot to put Holly's name on the slide. And so I'm in big trouble. <laughs> okay, taking all the credit, Brianna. Thank you so much. Um, any questions from council? We do have several. Um, Councilwoman Roach and then Councilman Serrano. Thank you for being here, Brianna. And just uh, wanting to go back and talk about the housing. Um, that one seemed like, that priority seemed like the one that had probably the least tangible um, bullet points. Is that something that we are following on the lead of AWC on and just going to wait to see what legislation comes about um, and get the update from you as it goes, as the session goes on? Thank you, Council Member. Yeah, you you kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, we are. I'm anticipating that we are going to see several dozen, if not over a hundred, different bills pertaining to housing. And this statement is written broadly so that we can 
look at those, evaluate each one in turn with city staff, and decide which ones really move the needle on housing along with the city of Pasco, you know, along with the city of Pasco priorities you all have been working on locally. I will note that last legislative session, we saw several housing bills that would have negatively impacted you all. And so we were weighing in um, expressing concern. And the statement in this agenda is broad enough to allow us to look at those proposals and provide input accordingly. Okay, thank you. And I'm um, just wondering if any of those housing, I guess this is more of a comment than a, um, than a question, but you know, where some of those housing, like transitional housing, might intersect with the next bullet point, which is public safety and behavioral health services. I think, um, at least for me as an individual council member, uh, gets us more bang for our buck in getting, um, getting our community what it needs because, you know, just how it's stated right now in the, the housing uh, priority, it seems like it's more, uh, it's more <laughs> focused on middle housing as opposed to that sort of lower income housing. So sure, thank you. The point. last sentence there says that the city supports uh, the housing trust fund to ensure housing is constructed at all, uh, to serve all income levels, which was my effort to try and speak to what you are commenting on. I can look at revisions to that language to make it more pointed. Okay, great, thank you. Councilman Serrano. Thank you. Um, is this, sheet the actual legislative priorities is it to be ranked if you will from top to bottom is that your intent here when great question it? i would say no um however um my loose advice is that you highlight your funding requests particularly within the capital budget at the top of the agenda um, because if the city is not highlighting and talking about our capital funding requests no one else will um, and that the policy issues follow thereafter Okay, and it seems that most of the public health, uh, public safety and behavioral health are policy oriented issues then. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Uh, I guess for that reason, I'm okay with leaving it lower, but I think those things are fundamentally need to be addressed by the legislature, and I hope that we can lobby hard. You know, I certainly hear anecdotally uh, vehicular pursuits is potentially leading to this issue that, um, you know, you may not be seeing that in the news, but down here we're seeing almost every week oncoming traffic head-on collisions and as i understand at least from speaking to folks on the ground some of those are duis and that's in part because there's no longer pursuit available and i don't necessarily need to put chief roski on the spot but again anecdotally that's what i'm hearing and um you know it's that's a pretty significant safety issue when people are going down 182 or i-82 the wrong way and head-oning um We'd, certainly, I think we'd all like to see that C sort of limited. So again, it be, being that these are uh, policy issues, I'm, I'm fine with leaving it down, but I hope that we give it the weight and the thought and the lobbying necessary. Thank you. Um, Mayor Pertamaloni. <laughs> thank you, Mayor Brahas. And thank you, Brianna, as always, for uh, for all your hard work in putting this together and the thought process that goes into it. Um, I will certainly echo um, both Councilman Serrano's comments as well as that it is getting a lot of attention and certainly in the uh, AWCO Legislative Priorities Committee, every city across the state agrees with you that there needs to be a fix. Um, they don't necessarily agree in the same direction or how exactly it should be fixed, but everyone agrees that this needs to be done. So I, I, I hope and believe that it will get the attention it needs, um, but we should still be vigilant in our lobbying to make sure that that's, that's happening. Um, I have two questions on the transportation slide. Um, so one is um, the second to last bullet. It's $2 million for a feasibility study to allow eastbound access onto 182. From where? I'm going to defer to your public works director. This is access to 182 from the area of 395 and Argent Road. Uh, their lack, or yeah, their lacks of. Uh, eastbound on ramp from Argent and so the question is is there a way for us to find a way to be able to get easier access from that area with all the development that the port is doing along uh, Argent Road that might be more helpful great um, so definitely support that I was just a little lost when I read that and I missed exactly what that was at uh, the other thing um, was is more specific so last session um, I testified on the bike ped facilities going um, going over 395 on Sylvester. 
and I know that's on our CIP, it's in our transportation master plan in a number of areas. I'm, I'm, this is, I guess, less a question for you, Brianna, and more to staff. Do we have that fully funded? For the pedestrian uh, improvements along Sylvester? The crossing 395. Crossing 395? Yeah. We have not received formal word that that project is fully funded, no. I, I will note, and Steve can correct me if I'm wrong, the last bullet on the draft agenda says to fully fund programs such as the Wash Dot Bike Ped program that will allow the city to receive grant programs. I believe the city has submitted a grant application to that program, and we're optimistic that we're going to compete well in that. But the way those grant programs work is WashDOT ranks all of the projects, and then the legislature chooses how much funding to allocate to that program and how far down the funding list to go. Um, so that is, that is why that bullet is there. And I, I don't know whether whether that grant results in full funding for the project. I guess that that's an item I would defer to Steve on. We have some information that might suggest that this project scored very well. Yeah, um, certainly, it's an area where I, I felt very passionate about it, talking to the legislature, and felt very um, personally and personally personally offended by the lack of any interest in the majority party to listen to our concerns and requests. Um, and it is actually one of the catalysts for why I volunteered with the AWC Legislative Committee, so uh, Priorities Committee. Um, so two bits of advice for anyone listening, don't volunteer angry, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> um, and also, um, in this, if there's, if there's any need or opportunity for us to continue to lobby on that behalf, I'd like that, I'd like to, that to be brought forward as a, as, a high, as a high item if it does not look like this is going well. This particular item um, is, a, is a desperate need for some of the most vulnerable people in our community. We need people connected to something as simple as grocery stores. And I appreciate that there is a bullet that covers that, and I would very much like to, if, if we need the opportunity to, I'll be more than happy to go yell at some folks. So just let me know. Thank you. Mayor, if, if I may, um, just out of point of personal privilege, I think you all know that I work with a lot of different cities from throughout the state. And um, and I, in that capacity, get an opportunity to work with a lot of different city managers from throughout the state. A big part of why our legislative program has been so successful over the years that I've advocated for you is because you have a very effective city staff and I've had extremely good leadership in Dave Zabel. And I just want to note that the success that we've had on our legislative program is in large part due to his leadership. And so with his departure, I wanted to just acknowledge that and thank him for all of his years of collaboration on our legislative issues. <laughs> Still got one more council meeting. Yes, but I will not be here for that one, especially when they go this late. <laughs>
I'm just going to get to the three big takeaways. 102 employees is what this request is. And that seems like a lot, and we'll walk through it. Uh, we have a few of them in some pretty big chunks, like the Animal uh, Control uh, Authority. And uh, that operation, that's 20 right there. We had 15 uh, firefighters funded through a safer grant. A uh, number of police officers to get us up to the West Coast average, about 1.4 uh, per 1,000. Uh, and we'll get we'll get into that detail, and department heads will uh, share some of that with you. But uh, 625.5 million for the biennium, and uh, 225, almost 226 of that is uh, uh, capital budget. So with that, uh, you know, this is not something that uh, we've been sitting in the back room cooking up numbers uh, the last few weeks. We've been working on this since May. Uh, usually we're at it a little bit earlier, but uh, it seems like a long time ago when you had a retreat uh, because we kind of waited for COVID to be over with so we could all meet in person, which I think that was uh, helpful uh, to be able to be together. Uh, our, our last budget, uh, biennial budget, we were talking a little bit today, we, we did that virtual. And I know that probably wasn't as any, any uh, uh, fun of an experience for the council members uh, involved in that decision making, having to do online as, uh, as it was for staff. But uh, you know, our budget's based on driven by council goals. And as I mentioned, uh, those were set back in May. Um, we, uh, we start our process in July and August uh, in, w with the uh, departments and uh, working on what the needs are gonna be for next year, what we're gonna finish up this year, those type of things. A lot of analysis goes on in the ensuing months. Uh, council just recently saw, our, uh, saw and adopted the capital improvement plan, which is a big driver uh, of the budget. Uh, we just completed, uh, I think, our last meeting, the ad valorem uh, in general fund revenue uh, hearing. And uh, council got to listen to some of that. And, and uh, uh, in November, we'll be through the budget hearings and, uh, and get to adoption. So one of the things we've we've had in our budget message for for quite a few different times, and uh, Mayor Tro Pro Tem Maloney mentioned it uh, uh, probably about a month ago uh, that we typically have. Why would they want us back? You know, if the city city services all went away, why would they want us back? And uh, you could hear you, you kind of talk a little bit about what's in the budget and uh, the different areas that align with your goals. Uh, and council has taken a lot of uh, time and effort to put those goals together, and, and we have a package that uh, supports those goals, including uh, you'll you'll hear uh, throughout the um, presentation how the 2023-2024 biennial budget uh, fits into the recently adopted master plans and system plans and so forth that council have seen and been working on over the past year and a half to two years. So. Uh, with that, uh, again, as I said, uh, you know, guiding the process, there's a lot of things involved in it uh, beyond the goals. The goals are driven by the uh, community survey, national community survey uh, helps drive those goals as well as listening sessions, uh, community meetings that we've had, uh, social media, a lot of input through there. We've had, you know, um, a lot of input at our council meetings about programs or initiatives as well as, uh, as I mentioned, our master planning efforts and comprehensive land use. Some of the key themes uh, that you're going to see in, in this uh, uh, proposal, uh, obviously we're still having to deal with, I shouldn't say having to deal with, we're fortunate to have uh, the impact of growth. We're a strong, very vit uh, vital uh, community with, uh, with a lot of investment occurring in it, and that's, that helps uh, lower the burden for taxpayers, uh, that kind of growth. And, uh, but it does create new demands and it's something we need to stay on top of and, and be looking forward to. Uh, long range planning efforts, as I mentioned, I've already mentioned a number of our plans that have been approved. Again, those are, those are reflected in this budget proposal. Capital projects, I said just a few minutes ago, about a quarter of a, quarter of a billion dollars worth of those in the biennium. Uh, economic development, uh, one of the things, you know, a number of items on there, but I want to note the downtown master plan and uh, the implementation of that plan you'll see reflected in this budget. And then uh, quality of life, um, one of the other 
projects I think uh, you know we're, we're going to see is uh, the community centers the the big upgrade at uh, uh, MOK Center as well as uh, a new center uh, planned for out west uh, IDEC and uh, the equity plan as well as uh, our public arts and culture. So those are all things that we kind of got a pretty good start on this last uh, biennium and, and uh, particularly the arts and culture is really gonna, I think you'll see that really start to come into its own. And then we have some new initiatives um, as well, the public facilities district and the city's role in that. Obviously we have a public facilities board, but the city's gonna have a very uh, significant uh, supporting role that you'll see reflected in the budget proposal. Uh, the animal shelter already mentioned, we've had discussion discussion about that. And then the uh, uh, basic law enforcement academy in Pasco. Again, a, an initiative on the on the part of the city. The chief was very successful and and uh, uh, the the uh, the folks over in Burien are very excited to be partnering up with the city of uh, city of Pasco on that effort. And uh, that'll be a great benefit to the region as well as to Pasco in our recruiting efforts and it's going to help us reach folks that we can't reach now. Uh, we have folks that they can't take the time to go to Beery and, and be away from their family for uh, 12 weeks, is it, Chief? 19, 19 weeks. Yeah, 19 weeks. Uh, be away from their family that period of time. We have a little more of a local academy. Uh, we'll be able to, you know, folks that may not otherwise be able to be a police officer, consider being a police officer, uh, We'll be able, be able to consider that uh, possibility. So some new policies and budget impacts, uh, animal control we talked about, uh, the public facilities district, uh, memorial pool bubble is uh, is one that we uh, uh, haven't, I haven't mentioned yet, but that's going to change a bit the landscape for uh, uh, the memorial pool over that, allowing for much longer season. Uh, implementation downtown plan, uh, the TIF, uh, tax increment financing, big project in our budget, $39 million. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, new, oops, sorry. Some new management responsibilities, uh, getting to a little bit of uh, detail. Uh, the, uh, the ACA or animal shelter and uh, animal uh, enforcement that's 20 staff members. So that's a big chunk of that uh, number we're looking at. Uh, we're also taking on all of the operations. So that includes uh, some, some additional assistance by the finance department, uh, contract management, so forth. Our impact of that we're, that we're gonna feel and the other two cities are gonna feel is about $133,000 each. So for us, that's, uh, I think it's gonna, you know, you, you look at $133,000, it's, and you compare services. It's, it's really hard to just say, look at it in terms of dollars and cents, but uh, council knows the history we've had here over the past several years, as well as the other two councils. And uh, we're gonna have a much higher quality of service uh, for the community and for the animals in our care uh, for that investment. Uh, the Public Facilities District, as I said, there's a number of things that need to happen with that that are going to involve our finance staff, our public work staff and in, con in uh, contract management and inspections and so forth, procurement, uh, more finance and uh, and other support uh, issues, the audit, for instance, uh, that, that we'll be uh, working on with them. And then Basic Law Enforcement Academy already spent a little bit of time on that already, but uh, it does include 2.5 employees. Those are be fully reimbursed by the state. So again, there's 2.5 that uh, we kind of knew was uh, it's it's part of that 102 and a half. But you know, that gets us to 22 and a half now that we we're pretty much paying for for the most part, uh, regardless of whether it's contracted or not. And again, when you talk about the kind of uh, return on investment we're going to get with the basic law enforcement academy. Academy, that could be uh, very significant. Uh, downtown master plan, already talked about that, but there's a number of, of uh, activities. I want to say there's about 34, it seems like, activities uh, that will have a, uh, an additional FTE working, uh, specifically imp implementing uh, some of those type of things. Uh, we have a wayfinding uh, project, uh, Peanuts Park North, 
and uh, we have also our downtown outdoor dining uh, furniture uh, funded by ARPA, and that includes you know some some uh, opportunities for lighting and potentially heating, cover those type of things. So, opportunity and and council's already provided some direction on that to to really start to assist our downtown business owners. Uh, so the new staff just going into that uh, really quickly. Uh, you, you can see, um, excuse me, in the general fund, we're looking at about 51, 50.9 50 or 51 positions. Uh, information systems, you know, obviously, uh, I don't, I don't want to get into necessarily all of these, but uh, you can kind of see some, some big numbers, ANCS, uh, you know, expansions of our park. Uh, the department heads will get into this more. Police, uh, it's an investment of 14. Uh, if I recall, I think about 10 of those are commissioned. Fire, that nine is part of the part of the 15 that uh, we have a safer grant for. Again, great investment. That's a three-year, 100% salary and benefit uh, type grant. And then uh, engineering support, as we have a very robust uh, capital uh, improvement uh, plan that we'll be executing on. On the uh, other funds, such as ambulance and, and the utilities, you can see another 51.1. So that gets us to our uh, our 100 plus uh, account. Ambulance, again, a number of those are uh, uh, safer grant funded, and uh, the rest would be coming from the ambulance fund itself. You see the animal shelter on there. That'll be, actually be its own fund. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and then you see a number of public works uh, type positions in there having to do with operations of our, our water treatment plants. Council's put a lot of investment and has in in planned a lot of investment for uh, improved uh, facilities and greater capacity. That does take more people to run it. So. Uh, some of the completed projects, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what's all done, and I'm not going to go into to all of them, I promise, but, uh, you know, this Argent Road widening is something we just completed in partnership with uh, the port and uh, uh, the community, uh, Columbia Basin Community College, uh, Sandifer Parkway widening, uh, the Burns Road pathways, I know that was a, a not a huge project, but uh, I think it added a lot of value to that area, made a lot of parents feel and kids feel safer. Uh, Columbia East Forest Main uh, and uh, Maple Drive Water Extension, even the small projects like that. Peanuts Park, uh, you can see on there. Uh, Palomino Parks, we have some great parks projects. And then, uh, you know, we, uh, the city's also, the Public Works Department's also in the last few years really started to ramp up our residential road preservation and wanted to, wanted to give that a nod too because we're, we're helping a lot of neighborhoods uh, uh, make some improvements there where uh, there hadn't been in the past. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the finance director to talk a little bit about uh, carryover. Good evening. Um, as you know, we do pass a capital improvement plan, and a carryover is a good process to have as part of those capital project budgeting. Uh, we introduced carryovers in the 2020 budget, and it is a recommended practice. And the reason for that is um, as capital projects often extend over more than one year, it allows us to not have to estimate at the end of one year where we, what will be remaining to be spent in the next year. So instead of including that in the coming year's budget, we just have a you we carry over what does not get spent in the pre previous year so we'll bring back to you a, a request to carry over those funds that were approved in the prior CIP and we'll move them to the next year and so you can expect to see that so we move to the next year and uh, next we're going to move to the department reports uh, and uh, starting with the general fund, do you want me to take that one? That's you. Okay. <laughs> Here is a slide for the general fund. Um, you can see uh, that the expenses and revenues both are increasing as we go through the last many years. Um, we have put a lot of effort into analyzing the general fund and have been helped by the departments. And um, so there's one slide. Um, 
There's not, and then, and then, of course, all the funds that are, that are the departments that are coming make up the general fund, so they can talk more. They'll build into that first slide that we looked at. And so next is Public Works Engineering. I want, to, I want to make one comment on the general fund slide. So if you look at the column uh, farthest to the right, and you'll note uh, expenses of 189, $189 million in change, and revenues of uh, about 180. So we got about a nine million. We're spending a little bit more than nine million dollars. We certainly have the fund balance for that. A lot of that is one-time. Actually, most of it's one-time dollars. So we're going to use some fund balance to get some projects done, such as uh, about a million and a half in uh, improvements to this building. Uh, there's debt service. Yeah, debt. We have new debt service on the. Uh, the tax and earned finance area. And right now we're, we're calculating that as all, debt ser all, all that debt service and no real increase in the property tax. That's probably not going to happen, but we, as, as we've shared with you before, we've kind of walked through the TIF project. There's going to be a few hungry years there at the beginning before the increment starts to pay its way. And then we'll start to see more revenues coming in there uh, due to higher increased increment between pre-development and developed state, as well as uh, sales tax, utility tax, those other taxes, they start to roll in. Uh, be a great return on investment for the city and be able to handle that additional debt. So that's about half of it right there. And uh, there's a few other things outlined in my budget uh, message to you. I don't wanna necessarily get into all that tonight. This is just really more of a primer. So with that, Steve. Next slide. Good evening. Uh, for Public Works Engineering, uh, there is a slight increase request for some additional staff. I think most of council members have seen the presentations that Public Works Engineering has presented this past year, and there is a lot of work going on. And so we are looking at adding some additional staff members to help accommodate all the additional projects that we are taking on. Uh, one of them is another CIP inspector. Uh, another one is a traffic engineer. And so we're very much looking forward to that. Uh, we think PASCO has now reached the time where a full-time traffic engineer would be very, very helpful to the community. And then we also have the need for uh, a, a, someone who helps us with the financial portions of our grants as well. We have a lot of state and federal grants that require specific information that needs to go to them. And uh, we just feel like we're gonna get a better return on our uh, grant and loan money by having that person. So. Uh, that's the proposal for engineering. Uh, the accomplishments that we've uh, uh, done this year, you can see that, or through the next bi this biennium, you can see the Lewis Street overpass. I think most people have seen that. Uh, we've done the Northwest sewer. We completed that LID, and we also started another one. And so we'll be moving that one forward. Uh, we've done a sewer comprehensive plan. Uh, we've done, looked at a lot of funding opportunities. And so far, we've come up with $66 million in grants and low interest loans. Uh, moving on, uh, then we get into the utilities and streets, and we've done a lot of overlay projects. Uh, we develop a pro policies and procedures for equipment maintenance and replacement, which has made the system much better. Uh, we've be rebuilt the air system at uh, Butterfield, and you can see on and on the accomplishments that uh, the operations f group has done for us. The goals for next year for engineering is to uh, launch the improvements for the Butterfield water treatment plant. Uh, which is ready to be replaced and improved and expanded. Uh, and then lots of other projects that you have already seen that we are going to be moving forward quickly. Same with our operations group. We're going to be creating a comprehensive asset management operating manual. Uh, and then a new operations facility is going to be designed and hopefully get some money to get it constructed. And then other things you can see on the list that are there that uh, we are going to be looking forward to. Bravo on the six. No, no question. Just comment. Bravo on the on the sixty-six million in procurement of grants and all of those other things that you just mentioned so quickly that they're already gone from my brain. <laughs> okay, great. And then I just point out on this slide too, we have a, a little bit more in the way of uh, expenditures than revenues in the far right column for the biennium. That's basically fund balance, bond proceeds, things like that that are for planned improvements that uh, 
uh, that uh, some are already in progress, but that we've been working on for you know last few years. Street fund, Steve, did you want to talk about? The street fund is again. It, some of this is related to the traffic engineering position, but we are looking at uh, expenses increasing a little bit just to cover all the additional streets. The annexation areas has increased the area that we have to operate and maintain, and obviously the growth that we're seeing with all the developments adds to the uh, infrastructure that the street fund is required to take care of. Okay, Colleen. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, on the human resources side, we did ask for an additional FTE. One half of that FTE is actually going to be funded out of our medical plan, so one half of a FTE will be coming out of the general fund. Uh, we are self-insured for our medical, so that does uh, take a lot of, um, uh, we take a lot of pride in that med medical plan, and so that will be part of what we use for that funding. And um, had I known that Dave was going to come forward with 102 positions, I probably would have asked for more than one position <laughs> because we will be very busy working with um, the HR staff, helping them develop uh, as specialists into generalists and, and doing more than just recruiting. But as you can see, that will be a big job for us in human resources. Thank you. Colleen, do you want to go to your accomplishments? I'm sorry. Oh. Sorry. Okay, so our accomplishments, we've uh, initiate, we initiated and implemented the new recruitment uh, applicant tracking, NeoGov, which is really throughout the state. We've inter, uh, implemented the department liaison focus style of management. We have specialists that will work with individual managers, directors, and uh, meet all the needs, their HR needs for each of those departments rather than kind of being piecemealed out. We've looked at collective bargaining, and that's been clean, completed for our firefighters. We have one to go for this year. And then we're looking at our methodology for storage of documents. And um, our goals, we're going to be looking at reviewing and updating the uh, municipal code and our administrative orders. We're looking, we'll be looking for a new third-party administrator in regards to some better service for our employees on our health plan. Uh, we're evaluating our safety and training program to make sure there's imp uh, improvements. And then again, looking at some additional software for our applicant tracking and looking at doing a salary or uh, employee survey to s see how our services and human resources are meeting the needs. Let me just get there. You go. Great. So, sorry, just one quick question, Colleen, before you run off. Um, your point about 100 employees and how much it takes to onboard, uh, to hire, but post hire, onboard, and just coordinate that whole thing. I think that's that's well received, and um, I see Dave averting his eyes because uh, um, I think he's uh, in agreement that at very least temporary support, if it's going to be a big ramp up for a bit, um, seems like it would be well, well money well utilized. There is nothing more frustrating than being a manager or employee and you can't get any HR time because they're just slammed back to back and overbooked. So. Um, Certainly, I'd be supportive of understanding if there is an impact um, that that what that looks like. Thank you. I appreciate that. And we we do we will try to put a good plan in place so people can uh, kind of understand that how that process will work for us and what we're able to fill and the priorities of filling those positions. We're already working on police and fire, so that we've got a big jump on that and animal shelter. So thank you, Director Chapin. May I offer one more? Sure. I, and I don't know if this goes to you or goes to Fire Chief uh, Gear, but I noticed on the the packet that it says that we're hiring about 12.6 and with an EMS ambulance um, staff, and wondering if there is or suggesting if there is the the um, the change to hire throughout the year as opposed to once a year for those positions. Um, well, we we do hire throughout the year. We we develop lists um, for those and hire throughout the year from those in accordance with civil service rules. And again, that's part of what we're looking for in our budget this year is doing some of our testing, outsourcing that through public safety testing. So that does allow for us to have a little bit diversified and not have as much focus out of our uh, internal HR staff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now, thank you. 
Hello again. Um, I'm here with the finance department. Uh, the finance department is made up of the accounting staff and accounts payable and payroll and uh, accounts receivable are part of that and then also utility billing. So we do have a request for two new staff members, which is a staff accountant to help uh, the rollout or the a change to the PFD Aquatic Center and support that effort and also to provide a little more uh, accounting support for uh, the process water reuse facility as it's growing and um, and then our other position is a department or excuse me a, a administrative assistant to help make documents and support the whole department as a um, whole. Uh, as far as accomplishments uh, this last year, we, or last two years, we spent um, a lot of time and effort um, on the American Rescue Plan Act and the utility and business uh, grant programs. We uh, supported the revenue requirements for ambulance, water, and sewer utilities. Uh, there are kiosks around town now that used to not be there. There, uh, people can make cash payments to them. So there's a few of those located. One here, one out at the Hapo Center, and one at the PUD, uh, which is nice because they can use them after hours. A little more convenient. Um, and then um, we have been using different opportunities like ClearGov and Tableau to try to make more documents and online presentations that are user friendly and easy to. Uh, understand. And then finally, we are working on, it is not finished yet, but we've made good strides in uh, making a transition to a new utility billing program and should complete that next year. Thank you, Dave. Um, uh, we want to make a comprehensive finance operations manual. There are a lot of questions that come up for the departments and they spend a lot of time trying to get answers and so having an easy resource that helps them uh, get what they need from finance will be one of our goals. Uh, we also uh, will be supporting debt issuances related to capital projects, including the TIF. Um, there is a, or we need to support both uh, funding source studies and plan implementation related to impact fees. And we also are going to uh, work on a long-term financial plan modeling program uh, for the general fund so we can anticipate uh, where needs are and where revenues and those two things cross so we can plan well. And finally, we'll help uh, with the uh, implementation of planning and permitting software that will take place next year. So thank you. Okay, with uh, community and economic development, uh, we'll be asking for four new positions, although roughly two and a half or almost three actually will be replacing the uh, contract services we temporarily hire out for. We've been using those services for four to five years, depending on the position. Uh, so it'll be a wash in terms of uh, costs for those, at least those three. The, the fourth is a planner two, which was hired mid uh, year this year to assist with simply workload and special planning efforts. <clears throat> Thanks. Oops. So our accomplishments this year, uh, we completed our comprehensive land use plan, uh, including, uh, well, almost including the Broadmoor master plan and assisting the tax increment financing uh, proposal. We uh, completed integration of one-stop permitting to support uh, customer interaction. Uh, we fully implemented, along those lines, uh, that, that was a, a marriage, so to speak, between engineering services and planning. Hopefully that will go a long way towards uh, increasing our permitting efficiency. And uh, then uh, you, council probably recalls the update to our uh, building and energy code requirements as mandated by the state, which was almost two years ago now. Uh, goals, it's, the year of the plan, so to speak, uh, we have the downtown master plan that we hope to get adopted, uh, if not by the end of this year, by early in 2023. Uh, the housing capacity plan we intend to complete by the end of 2023. The Broadmoor master plan should be along the same time frame as the downtown master plan, maybe a bit before. Uh, the shoreline master plan, again, a mandated uh, plan update by the state of Washington and the economic development strategy plan, the city's first 
that we hope to have complete by the end of 2023. So there's, you'll be seeing a lot of long-term planning efforts this coming year. All right, for administrative and community services, um, we are a very diverse department with a lot of uh, different divisions underneath it. We are known uh, internally, at least, as the Swiss Army Knife of the city. Hopefully it catches on with the other directors and staff this year. Um, you'll see a big jump in our spending, and a lot of that is technolo technological and technology-based. Um, information services is one of our divisions. Uh, we have a lot of focus on some one-time purchases. These are software upgrades. Cybersecurity is a huge goal that came out of our master plan as well. Um, one of the most more notable one-time purchases is uh, what we call virtual desktops. So this will allow us to implement a virtual desktop server system, but that would translate into you know the laptops and the desktop computers that are issued to staff would be a little bit less expensive moving forward. Um, allow us a little bit more versatility in the hardware that we deliver to get the work done. Um, some of the staffing requests that we have put in, um, a lot, you know, we have a lot of technology ones in there, the importance of cybersecurity, getting some more people in um, to address that. Um, we have additional facilities coming online, and the facilities we have now are aging. Um, we have three uh, current uh, facilities staff members, so we put in requests for additional there just to help with workload and uh, maybe get ahead of some of the uh, internal facility items. We've added new parks, new acreage. We have a lot of focus downtown with Peanuts Park and making sure that's maintained as well. So our grounds crew, um, we're looking to grow that and uh, have additional focus on the, a lot of the acreage that we'll talk about coming on in the uh, next biennium. Um, park rangers too, uh, to help with uh, just general park rule enforcement and um, you know the facilitation of the, the rental of shelters, things like that. And um, yeah, just, uh, just to enforce access to our facilities. So some of our accomplishments, um, you know, we're, we're, we're still implementing technological advances. Um, technology is such a foundation to our daily work for the community. Um, I'm a big fan of master plans. Uh, we're gonna be, uh, we're in final review of our parks master plan. We'll be introduced to council hopefully in November, if not December, um, as well as our I information systems master plan, which is governing a lot of our efforts um, for staff deployment, as well as uh, technological advances. We've added new parks. I mean, Peanuts Park, we talked about, Palomino Park. Uh, Recreation Services implemented the SEAT grant program. We were able to take low-income kids to do sports camps, high adventure hikes, and uh, we did tours of uh, UW, Eastern Washington, and WSU Pullman, and the Tri-Cities campuses for kids that may not be able to get out there and, and look at what college is like and take an individualized tour. And yeah, emergency operations of the animal control shelter um, certainly uh, took an impact this year, and uh, we had a lot of great staff step up and help with that. Our goals coming here, um, Dave mentioned, uh, excuse me, Mr. Zabel mentioned that we uh, uh, are staffing the animal shelter. We're going to have a new facility for them as well. Um, that's about to go out to bid this week and uh, hopefully commence construction in the coming months. Um, <clears throat> we're adding new parks facilities. Schlegel Park is under contract. A Street's uh, about to be deployed. MLK revisions and the pool bubble. Um, we want to review park impact fees to make sure we're capturing that revenue to help with the new growth and uh, certainly implement our new permitting and uh, code enforcement software and uh, just technological improvements to improve efficiency as we deliver services to the community. A question. Yes. If you can step back real quick. Uh, as part of your new park design standards, does that include now, uh, per request from our community, ADA um, accessible? Yes, we are working on that specific request as well as the uh, improving our ADA accessibility citywide. Um, our park design standards will include, yeah, certainly what we can do to, you know, for, for modern patrons of the parks and, and just to meet our standards, but also see how we can get just better parks built as development comes in. But yes, definitely ADA is uh, on the forefront of that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. I think next up we have is uh, police. Thank you, Mr. Zabel. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council members, uh, City Manager had alluded to earlier the 14 positions for the police department. 12 of those are commissioned police officers uh, that we will uh, uh, deploy into the field uh, for to help us address the strategic plan that we have in place. Two of those um, are staff positions. Three of those positions are going to be funded by the state, as Mr. Zabel had mentioned, for the 
uh, Basic Law Enforcement Academy. Some uh, accomplishments this past year, a laundry list of them, but some key highlights for you are listed here. Uh, we completed the strategic plan. That was a big lift for us, but uh, a, a guiding document for us to share with you and for us to move forward with. Uh, we continued to work on our uh, homeless liaison program to help with the homeless uh, 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 situation in our city, um, even with the hurdles that were, uh, were thrust upon us, we made progress there. Uh, we had some um, um, recent challenges working with Mr. Ferguson's office now to try and find some workarounds, though it seems like every time we get a couple steps forward, we have some things moving backwards, but we are, uh, we are proud of the, the success that we did, limited success that we did have there. Our community engagement uh, continues to be an important part of what we do. Uh, everything from our national night out to our community engagements to ice cream carts to everything else that we do all drives us into crime fighting, crime reduction, quality of life, um, and building that trust and legitimate legitimacy for the police department. Um, yep. That might sound uh, like an easy task, but it isn't. It takes us out there all the time engaging with the community, and that's why it's one of our accomplishments, and you'll see it's one of our goals next year as well. Um, we implemented uh, Chief, a couple of... Sorry, can I, sorry for interrupting. Can we advance the slides, please? I think you're reading off those, and I <laughs> I, I need both to be I'm able with to you. Yeah, yeah, Thank I you. Apologize. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so uh, we implemented some technology to help us um, um, better provide quality control quality assurance to the public when they're calling 911, requesting police services. They get an automated response. Uh, many of you may have got those. We'll have the next phase of that we're rolling out right now called My90, which is another piece of community engagement. This is going to be post the call down the line. You'll get an automated text message back just surveying on how we did and what can we improve on. So again, just, just an opportunity to figure out um, where we can learn, do better, and then, of course, provide you as best information when you're calling. You might be a little frustrated. Did that call actually get dispatched to an officer? This uh, technology helps with that, and uh, this was our first year rolling that out. Um, and then uh, our uh, unmanned aircraft project is fully operational. Uh, uh, nine aircraft, uh, ten aircraft with eight pilots, and uh, it has proven to be extremely beneficial from... Um, officer safety and crime reduction. We use it daily um, in Pasco and it's requested across the Tri-Cities for a myriad of, of search and rescue and crime events. So a uh, very successful program. And then uh, just quickly, the goals for the department as we look into the, uh, the next biennium, uh, again, take the strategic plan, work on that as we move forward to help guide us. Um, work with our partners at the fire department to enhance the navigator program, which has, um, uh, it is extremely beneficial, but we need to uh, get some life uh, back into that and the, the fire department's gonna help us with that. And that will translate into uh, uh, people experiencing homelessness and mental, mental illness. Uh, I mentioned uh, community engagement, branding and imaging of the police department, again, it, it, it all lends toward uh, transparency, legitimacy, and trust of the police department. Um, the uh, district policing model uh, will be uh, a, a stood up this year. That's going to give us an opportunity to better engage in the community at the uh, micro levels uh, in our neighborhoods and allow us to take what we're doing now with uh, data-driven policing and uh, do a better job at directing our resources where they're, where they're best needed to combat uh, crime and crime trends as, as they're um, on the rise. And then finally, uh, I think enough has been said about the Basic Law Enforcement Academy and that coming here uh, to Pasco. We're extremely proud that the state recognized Pasco and they're giving us an opportunity to pilot that project, uh, which I, uh, I know will be uh, duplicated across the state uh, once, once we actually have ours stood up and, and they can see how we're doing it here. So. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, so city manager budget. Uh, you can see a little uptick there in uh, positions, and what uh, is being proposed is three positions. Uh, one, an analyst. Uh, number of initiatives that uh, the city is, is running and uh, 
Well, I'm going to talk about accomplishments and goals in a few minutes, and you'll kind of get it. Uh, but um, OpenGov and track it and downtown, there's a lot of things that the city manager's office needs to kind of keep a handle on uh, or, or handle on the pulse of. And, uh, oh, I kind of mangled a couple of them there, didn't I? Yeah. Anyway, uh, um, I, that, that's a necessary uh, position we feel to, to kind of help administer those projects and help the departments. Uh, administrative assistant, we've talked a little bit about that at the retreat, even our most recent retreat, and uh, you know, a little bit additional support for staff or excuse me, for, for council. Uh, I think that analyst can provide some of that as well. And then also uh, a, a new position uh, that we haven't had before we have a deputy city manager, which is a very high level um, senior management position. This would be more of a moderate level position, assistant city manager, and uh. Uh, doesn't take away from the support, uh, and this is really more of an upgrade. But uh, it's a high level analysis, high level analysis, uh, a little bit more horsepower than we can have right now, and uh, more of a team project manager on some of these initiatives that uh, that we're taking on. We can chat about that a little bit more uh, later. But those are the those are the three uh, positions in the city manager's office. So some of the things that. Uh, uh, we've been involved in and and uh, the odd thing about the city manager's office when you start talking about what did you get done and what are your goals for next year well what we got done is making sure everybody else got done what they were supposed to get done you know it's hard to write that in a bullet but uh, so we're involved in things across the whole spectrum and uh, and uh, your deputy city manager has been uh, <clears throat> taking on taking a lot a lot of those initiatives uh, himself this year. Uh, I, I'm involved with a lot of them as well, but uh, tax and current financing, something we've both been involved in quite a bit. Uh, downtown master plan, uh, the ARPA program, there, that's, that's been kind of an all hands on deck. Uh, Angela sean has been involved with that. Uh, successful transition of the city, Tri-City Animal Shelter. Yeah, that was pretty much Angela. Uh, our uh, senior management analyst uh, took that shelter on and you know it's come at the cost of other things not being able to get done and uh, which is one of the reasons for the for the additional staff uh, request uh, we do have the just side note we do have the sh uh, permanent shelter manager position uh, out to add right now and and uh, hopefully that'll be a successful recruitment and we'll have angela back full-time in the office here shortly and then uh, the expansion of the city's economic development program that that uh, is going to continue uh, we heard a little bit earlier from uh, director white about the economic development plan that's obviously something we'll be involved in uh, 2024 goals is you know we're gonna have a city, new city manager gonna have to get up to speed uh, get on boarded uh, that's going to be a, a big piece and then we can see there's a number of number of other things and then re-engagement at, at a little higher level with uh, than we've been able to this year with arts and culture uh, the equity plan and what comes out of that in terms of uh, uh, the I, a, a new I, newly formed IDEC committee with a with a new charter those type of things so uh, and then city council, I can talk about this budget. We're not proposing to add any more positions in this one. Uh, you can see expenditures are pretty flat. And uh, municipal court, I will go through that, though. So there is a request for two positions in municipal court. And you have to excuse me a second. There they are. Uh, a community justice counselor, which, if I'm not mistaken, 100% grant funded for the first year. Likely will be 100% grant fund funded for the second year, but they have to go through that process. And then a, an additional uh, deputy court clerk, really just attributable to, uh, you know, the, the increase in, in caseload and, and the needs of the court. So overall, a fairly uh, modest uh, presentation. You can see they've, they've been busy. They've managed to uh, work through a number of things in that department. And our GAP program, our graffiti abatement program, is in there. And... Uh, you know they they've had some they had some setbacks during COVID in terms of uh, really their program was just the two employees because they, they didn't have the volunteers and so that's cranked back up and, and moving along well uh, you can see some software upgrades in there you can see uh, note of the 
grant from the Office of Courts for $116,000 for that uh, probation position. And then uh, 20, uh, 24, 23, 24 goals, um, collection and referral, that's, that's something that uh, council has asked questions on in the past. Unfortunately, the judge is not here tonight, but he will we be at a future meeting and, and council will be able to talk a little bit about that because I know that's been of interest to council. Uh, we actually get to expand the work crew program. So like I say, that's it's kind of making its way back and and that's been a very effective uh, program all, uh, through the years. And then with our probation position, we'll, we'll also be establishing a new uh, case management system. So, uh, And I'm going to turn it over to Chief Gear now for fire. Are we, Ed, are you doing it or Chief? Yeah, I think I am. Okay. Chief Gear's uh, dealing with some stuff at, at home right now. So as alluded to earlier, we did get a safer grant. So on the general fund side, we're looking to fund or fill six positions um, with the safer grant. So it's fully funded for the first three years. Uh, we're converting two temporary positions that we had identified into full-time, so they're actually underneath there. So that's kind of a zero cost. It's been covered in overtime up to this year. Uh, and then as we've grown, as we bring stations 85 online in the next uh, year or so, then we will uh, need some additional help for our administrative assistant and also just a logistics man manager so we can get the battalion chief down doing what he needs to be doing managing uh, the shift while the logistics person helps manage day-to-day -day operations of the city. So some of the things, so that's where we're at with the personnel. So some of our accomplishments this year, oh, do we want to do ambulance at the same time? Let's do ambulance, yeah. Okay, uh, follow up on ambulance as well. Uh, you heard 12.6, uh, nine of those are from the SAFER grant, so total for 15 split between nine to six, uh, ambulance to fire. Uh, the administrative assistant logistics manager also goes in there half and half because they support equally on, on both sides. And then we're teaming with uh, information services to get uh, part of a person to help with just RIS. We've got significant uh, impacts on keeping things alive in this technology um, area. And we're also converting to temporary to full-time positions. So that's our, our 21 basically total new hires or positions within the fire and ambulance budget. So with that, we'll move on to the accomplishments of what we did. Um, we relocated both 83 and 84 uh, successfully. Uh, the headquarters for the department now is located at station four in the center of the city. So we're actually with one of the fire stations instead of being separated. So we have a much better working relationship with that and the community. Uh, the fire ground tra command training lab uh, was put in place. That was funded through the Department of Homeland Security grant funding with uh, Franklin County Emergency Management. That allows a high level of training for our officers to better manage incidents as we move forward. Uh, you guys heard the, the another master plan from us, and that's what we're working on to implement. Uh, the spill response program uh, was implemented. We have a spill response boat through a grant that we did. Um, as well as partnering with some tank farms and other agencies along the river. Uh, and then we also got an SCBA uh, air pack grant um, that we put those in service over the last year. So that was about a half a million dollars we were able to do. Moving forward as we move, uh, our goal is to retain that uh, protection class three rating and we will be rated in 2023. Uh, so that's why we did the master plan, the strategic plan that all feeds into that. Uh, with part of that, we're trying to get into the high hazard uh, occupancies that impact that rating. Um, update the community risk assessment. That all ties back into our resource navigator and other aspects as we prevent fires that works back towards that WSRB rating. Um, we're going to continue to to increase our resource navigator program. We went came to you this last month and and ask for some increases and use the ARPA funding so we can get some additional resources to deal with the mental and behavioral health and team with our partners, the police department and their impacts on that. Um, Chief Gear is one of the key members on that with that Benton Franklin Behavioral Health Advisory Committee. He actually sits on that board and is driving that forward and we're gonna see how we implement that over the, the next couple of years. Um, and then we just continue to to work with our partners, uh, we're one of the things you'll see next year is a standards of cover document. Basically, what's our level of service? How do we maintain it moving forward? Um, and 
looking for support uh, and we're going to team that up with Richland and Kennewick so we're kind of looking not just at Pasco but the whole Tri-Cities area so that's kind of where we're at with fire Yeah, city manager Zay, well, real quick, back to your goals. We're covering a lot, a lot of information about the master plan. And I just wanted to ask the question directly, has our process in streamlining these goals helped you be more flexible and efficient with accomplishing all the work that we've covered and then some? Before our goals, for those of us who are in the audience who may be not familiar, they were strictly bulletized. And I think that a lot of the stuff that was maybe here would have been up there, but then we would have probably missed opportunities. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I think that's an accurate statement. Uh, certainly the, the master plan uh, efforts that the different departments uh, have accomplished and the city councils uh, reviewed. In some cases, uh, other committees have reviewed before city councils. A lot of work goes into those and staff is very familiar with them. And taking them as a more holistic uh, uh, step forward rather than pulling pieces out of them, I, I think uh, will benefit the city in the long run. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, just the sheer volume of stuff that we've covered already so far is, has been impressive. And again, we've whittled down our council goals from a very lengthy document to something that's a little more streamlined, seems a lot more agile for, a tool for you guys to use and are utilizing. So thank you. That gives us more excuses to ask for stuff too, by the way. But, uh, Okay, so golf course fund, uh, Director Retka, you want to touch base on that? This reflects the change in the contract. Yeah, it's, um, we went from sort of the management agreement with the course code for the golf course to just the straight lease year over year. Course code taking responsibility for the business operations and thus uh, the financials. Uh, we do have some revenue enhancements should we have a really good year of revenue. Um, that'll be dictated uh, year by year. So, yeah, it's significantly reduced, but don't let that uh, dissuade anyone from going to one of our good golf facilities in the Tri-Cities right here in Pasco. Okay, CBDG, Director White's going to walk us through that again. Or what, maybe, I, I apologize, Finance Director is going to walk us through that. Good evening. Um, this is for the Community Development Block Grant, and you can see that year that is very high in expense and revenue, and that is from our Section 108 loan that paid for, in part, the Peanuts Park construction and remodel. And so that it stays a little high this next biennium, and that's because we're paying the debt service back on that loan, and we'll do that for, mm, I think, about 20 years. I can't remember for sure the full extent of the loan, but so it'll, it'll be about that for quite some time. And I'm going to do the next slide, I believe, too. And the ARPA fund, um, we just established this fund last year. Um, and of course, you know, there's been many initiatives that have come from it. Um, it is, uh, we will perhaps spend all the money this biennium. Um, it will, does need to be all uh, assigned. So the difference between um, what has been provided to the city and the planned projects, there's a uh, remaining approximate $500,000 that is available for ARPA eligible projects. Yeah. I, I actually oh, need to make a comment mm -hmm. on this, and maybe I can make it because I am uh, going to be leaving pretty soon. But it was kind of interesting. Uh, we had a, had a chamber event, uh, Hispanic, uh, Tri City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, as well as uh, uh, there was a plug for it as well at the um, regional. Uh, Chamber of Commerce for a program Benton County is doing for business assistance. And uh, it was kind of being plugged like it was brand new. No offense to folks that are doing it. I'm glad you're doing it. But uh, this council uh, was way up in front on that and uh, was doing this stuff 14, 15, 16 months ago. So I wanted to kind of acknowledge council on that. The one change that we did make here is uh, we have a person that was fully assigned to the ARPA fund, and as times have changed and she is not needed to be fully assigned anymore, we've split that. So it does take some of the expenses out of the ARPA fund and leaves that funding available for other projects. And then the Animal Shelter Operations Fund, as you can tell, is new. <laughs> And we will come to you and ha actually ask for authority to 
create the fund. So you'll see that coming and uh, we have budgeted here the anticipated cost um, for the, that management activity. So th this next slide is uh, basically just a listing and a status of a number of uh, plans and efforts uh, that uh, uh, has been underway uh, over the past uh, year or so. And you can kind of see uh, the title of the plan, the next steps, uh, what council goal it's aligned with, as well as the uh, biennial budget so I don't, I don't necessarily want to go into that but you can see some number of those are downtown master plan for instance is adopted and we're going to be into the implementation phase in this biennium the police strategic plan we're already into the implementation phase with uh, with this budget the water um, uh, front zoning district also adopted into implementation so uh, i think it's just a good reflection on the work that's getting done and uh, the way the strategic uh, uh, process by which uh, we're moving forward in, in a number of different areas. And I, I don't, does council have this um, PowerPoint? Because we're, we're burning the midnight oil right up until the half hour before the meeting. So we'll make sure you have a, a copy of this along with the budget uh, message that, uh, that you were provided. So. Uh, items for future consideration and, and budget impacts, um, you know, uh, and this this has to do with your the planning efforts that you're doing now and your goals, uh, staying in step with community growth. Uh, you know, this budget uh, provides new staff to meet city service needs. Uh, our capital projects and funding, uh, you'll note, uh, 200 and I think 25 I think million I said that's. Those are funded projects. That's pretty exciting. That when I when I got here, our six year CIP was two hundred and something million dollars for six years. So council's getting a lot of stuff done. Uh, you heard a lot of discussion tonight about alignment of our resources, and uh, you can see where we're trying to leverage cost centers and and uh, try to extend our staff and, and their ability and uh, their reach as far as we can. Uh, Equity of impact, you know, we have a number of uh, initiatives uh, uh, going on. The traffic impact fee, uh, something that we're going to be working on, uh, not to be confused with the other TIF. Uh, this is often called TIF, too. But uh, right now, we only have a fee associated with uh, I-182, and I, I want to say we're $42 a peak hour trip. Does that sound about right? Uh, that's a pretty low amount. Yeah, and that's that's a very old number uh we're in the process of evaluating that and uh, we'll be working with the public uh our developer group uh and then later the council to to share that uh fire impact fee uh, we have a lot of growth that's going to occur up in the north uh, west part of the city uh, there's going to be a need for a fire station 86 up in that area also there's a need for a you know right now a, a need on the horizon, near-term horizon, for a fire station 87 in the industrial area. And those are things that uh, the people that are causing those impacts should have a upfront role in, in playing rather than, than uh, getting us behind, for instance, in our community rating and then every, every, all the taxpayers paying for it. So, And then our capital, um, capital expansion fee, uh, those again have not been updated a long time for water sewer or some of those other utilities so we're doing that fee analysis as well uh, capital investment for the TIF area again that's you know 39 million dollars uh, tax increment financing uh, council will be considering that ordinance and we've talked a lot about it so I'm not going to necessarily get into it tonight but you could be considering adoption of that ordinance uh, next week and I think probably uh, I guess the short takeaway on that is that's that's going to provide for and allow for a much higher quality development and a lot higher return on investment basically forever for the city. I mean, it's it's the difference between mini storages and RV centers. Not that there's anything wrong with those. Those are great, but we have a great opportunity on a, on a piece of property that's 700 acres on the on an interchange on an interstate freeway in the middle of the dry city so we need to maximize that opportunity the best we can as a city 
planning efforts in the in the biennium. Did we just cut? My apologies on that. Uh, so action items completed uh, in the budget process itself. Uh, council approved uh, last week the ad valorem uh, property tax uh, uh, ordinance, uh, acceptance of a safer grant. Uh, those are things you've already done, as well as approval to manage the animal shelter. And again, you saw those uh, reflected uh, in the budget proposal. Uh, Still yet to talk about, and I think that's probably slated for November 7th, talk a little bit about an ambulance rate study and the results of that. Um, adopt the uh, biennial budget and then approve the creation of the animal shelter fund as discussed by the finance director just a few minutes ago. Uh, just a little bit of a schedule here. Um, so TIF next week. Uh, budget document uh, provided the council. We need a few more days to get that to you. So trying to get you that in, in, in plenty of time so you got some time to take a good look at it. You do have a fairly comprehensive budget message in here, uh, several pages long. But uh, that, that'll get you some op an opportunity four or five days uh, prior to the um, uh, November 7th meeting. First reading of the budget hearing and, and public hearing, first reading of the budget and uh, uh, public hearing will be on 11-7, and then a couple weeks to kind of digest all you've heard, let the public digest what they've heard, and a second reading of the budget ordinance and public hearing on the 21st. So that's kind of the schedule right now. Certainly that's council's purview. If uh, uh, I, I would just uh, advise that we do need to have the budget adopted prior to the end of the year. That's statutory, so that has to happen. And... Uh, this was uh, this was a big leap. This budget, I'd say, you know, it, it's I, I don't think I've well I can tell you for sure for a fact I've never proposed a hundred uh, additional FTEs. But I think you look through that and uh, what the basis of those are. Uh, I think it's a it's a very reasonable request given where we're at. City of Pasco is it's evolved. It's no longer a small city. Uh, and I, I will also note that we, because of uh, uh, the conditions over the last couple of years, maybe a little bit uh, extra conservative, and uh, now we need to provide you. Folks are paying those taxes. They need those services. So it, it doesn't do the public any good for us to sit on a pile of money. You know, we, we need to be responsible about having sufficient reserves, and building sufficient reserves, but uh, excess reserves is just services not being provided to the public. So uh, this is my final budget to council, and uh, I thank you for letting me do this two weeks early. And I thank uh, finance staff and the rest of the staff for uh, really hitting it hard to, to get, this, uh, get these numbers together and allow this presentation. Uh, for Adam, I didn't. I didn't want to put him in the position as the interim city manager and a candidate uh, coming to you and asking you for 100 employees. That would have been really awkward for him, I think. You know, and uh, even if you get mad at me, I'll be cool with it next week. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, I uh, I want to also thank this council and, and the councils prior that I've worked with in the last eight years for your guidance and support over the last, uh, over the time I've been here. Uh, I, I can honestly say, including this budget, uh, that this uh, PASCO has probably been the most, not probably, it's been the most challenging and uh, satisfying and productive um, time of my 42 career, 42 year career in uh, local government, uh, in large part due to support and guidance from the councils that we've had, this council and prior councils but also in large part uh, to the credible team of professionals that we have working in the city uh, that put their heart and their backs and their hearts into or heart, backs and soul into the bettering our community. So that concludes my trailer for you. And uh, you'll see a little bit more of this on the 7th. Uh, you'll get your document, as I said, in about a week or so. And uh, I wish council the best in working through this budget. And if you have any questions, 
right there. Yeah. That's the way Thank to you. go. Any questions, please delegate to uh, City Manager Adam Lincoln. Thank you so much, uh, Dave. And there's a comment uh, question uh, by Councilman uh, Campos. I didn't like that trailer at all. Could you do it again? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, thanks, Dave. This has uh, been a learning experience for my first biannual budget. Um, learned a lot. Again, super proud of the work that we as a team have done, the legislative body and the uh, executive body to accomplish all that work. Any further questions or comments? Uh, comment from Mayor Pratt Maloney. Thank you, Mayor Rojas, and thank you, uh, City Manager and, and staff. Um, I do know how much work goes into this, and there's, there's a lot to this. Um, you know, one, of the, one of the questions I've already tipped my, my, my hand on uh, a couple times is that I'm going to ask, you know, is this implementing this, the uh, master plans? I took one example of that and I looked at the police, uh, the, the police ask for 14 FTEs. And I went back and looked at the master plan and go, okay, what did the master plan recommend and in what areas? And the um, master plan recommended a total of 24 people. And so this is a down payment. And I, I'm not, not to say that all master plans aren't... Um, um, maybe you know aiming for for a target harder than what, higher than what we as a city can afford, but um, it's a great example of, of of using those master plans and then going and in the budget cycle now we're being asked for the money to pay for the master plan that we approved and was presented to us by by our by our staff and uh, and, and the consultants. So um, you know, big kudos for 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 that linkage and that that hard strategic work that we've been doing over over years to mature us as a city and as an organization is bearing fruit, and you can see it in this budget. Even though you're asking for an absolutely absurd number of people for a city of our size, every one of those is justified and ties back to actions that we as a council have been briefed on um, for for services that we believe the city needs and that we have approved most of them um, through those strategic plans. So. Um, love the linkage, love the, uh, the connection there. So, um, yeah, um, uh, even though this is a, that's a shocking number, Dave, I'll be honest, I did not expect that coming into here. Um, I, I have questions, but they're on the fringes, not the core. So I did send you an email earlier today with that number in it and you never responded. So I knew you were shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I may be a little busy too. <laughs> okay. Sure. Um, yeah, so, so all right, so more, to, more to come on this. I'll, I'll, I'll ask my questions once we get that budget in front of us, but um, yeah, excited. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, and I, I will, I, the other thing I want to mention too is uh, we lost a, a, a great uh, finance director in Richa who has walked us through our last few budgets. And uh, one thing she did do is also create a great team. And so these numbers are tight. Uh, finance director and the finance manager they didn't lose a step uh, i have a great deal of confidence in this budget that it all ties back together and and it uh it says what it says and uh, it, it can be backed up so yeah. thank you thank you very much any further questions or comments i just want to say thank you for getting this budget in front of um all of us uh wasn't expecting this budget message and it's really thorough um on what's been accomplished in terms of master plans, but also want to say that this is my first budget by NEM as well in person. So um, I think one thing that um, I appreciate is the, the, the strategic planning that's gone into these master plans and then seeing what's been accomplished and what's been implemented um, in this highlights reel. And um, also your floor planning and not leaving this to the interim city manager and others uh, prior to your departure, um, and also making good strategic hires in, in Richa, Adam, and every other director that you've hired and brought on to the city. So thank you for that. I won't be in person next Monday um, for our TIF meeting. I'll be remote. So I just want to say thank you for your service to the city of Pasco, too. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Thank you, Dave. Um, excellent work by staff, finance directors, everyone on board. Uh, excellent presentation. It is a high number of staff that you're requesting. However, we do need it. We are growing and uh, looking forward to seeing 
some numbers on this. Um, moving on to our very last item. Item D, Resolution Argent Road Phase 1 Project Acceptance by Director Worley. Or Good evening, Madam Mayor. Mayor. I'd like to turn this over to Maria Serra, our Capital Improvement Program Manager. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. This is going to be so fast. <laughs> So we are presenting to you a resolution to accept the work of Colbert Construction for uh, the work performed at Argent Road between 20th Avenue and Saraceno Way. This is phase one of the Argent project. There's three projects. Uh, phase one is the one we're talking about. Phase two is currently in construction. Phase three is expected to be in construction next year. And what you're seeing in the screen is just vicinity map, construction cost, and change order amount under 1%, or just about 1%, it's not under, it's just about 1%, um, due to some uh, non-located utilities and some changes to striping that need to happen. And then the fun part now is seeing the pictures, before pictures, during pictures, and you're seeing we were widening the road, adding pedestrian facilities, a multi-use pathway on one of, one of the sides of the street, um, new traffic signal, new islands, uh, ADA compliant ramps, all the things. And here you see it is happening, the salt construction, the new cabinet for the signal, the pathway, the additional lane, and this is the complete project. Real fast, <laughs> almost a video. Okay, and that's it. I'll take any questions. <laughs> that was that was way too quick. Super quick. You guys win my gold star again for tonight. Um, uh, I'll keep this brief. I don't need the answers tonight. I'm curious to see what metrics we have on traffic safety, accident, uh, like have they reduced? Um, I know that as a student at CBC that it was always congested. So I'd like to see some metrics on it just out of curiosity. Uh, again, it doesn't have to be tonight. Tomorrow would be great. <laughs> you mean like two hours or? Yeah. Well. <laughs> Any further questions or comments on this item? Thank you. Okay. Let me go back to my agenda here. Um, item six, miscellaneous council discussion. Just a few items there. Uh, so we have a retirement celebration for uh, Officer Jason Griffin, 15 years. Uh, that'll be in the uh, PD community room at 3 p.m. on the 26th. And then we have uh, Sylvester Street um, Safety Improvement Project is going to be holding its second open house on November 10th, so a little ways out, but uh, mark your calendar, 6 p.m. in the council chambers. I think we have, I was hoping we had his picture up there, but... Uh, yeah, Ben Shear was recognized for an award by the Washington State uh, Association of Fire Marshals recently at a conference. Uh, uh, we can get that out to you. Maybe. There it is. There he is. Uh, and then uh, there actually is a retirement open house here at City Hall on Friday at 2 for me. And, uh, you know, in, in the council chambers. So hope to see you there. And that's all I had. Thank you. Next item on my agenda, executive session. I believe we have a need for an executive session. We had a couple items, yes. I have um, update on the IAFF. Which items is under? I don't have a, so I was not provided with the, yeah, no. The, is this potential litigation? Is this so it sounds like uh, there's an up, there's some potential litigation as well as a update on negotiations. Yeah. That's what it oh, uh, 4231101 uh, I, and then I believe negotiations, I think that's excluded. I don't even think we have to uh, make that part of the executive session. So it's not on my agenda. I apologize. I'm looking at an email. Okay. And the email does not specify which RCW, so that's why we're trying to figure it out. Yeah, I can send it to you. Let me. Yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. Um, so. No, it's not going to be I. It's going to be. Um, it's the. It's, oh, it's the. It thinks K, right? What would it be K? So we figure out K and see if we see about the sex of Eric. Eric is K appropriate. Discussion with legal counsel about legal risk to current or proposed action. For R C W. So. I'd Bear with us just a minute. So we are looking at indigo and llama. I know. Okay. Hey, my brain so far. Okay. Here we go. We are looking at discussion with legal counsel regarding agency enforcement actions per RCW 42.30.110 LI and. So, no, that was I. Just I. Okay. Just I. And then, then we're going to have discussion with legal counsel about. L. There's no L. There's no L. Oh, here's L. So if, if you look at that, that's a separate RCW. So we're not actually under executive session. It's a separate meeting. It's not covered by open, open public meetings. That's why okay. it's a separate RCW, I believe. Second page is the Discuss, uh, discuss Collective Bargaining Unit Negotiations per RCW 42.30.140. Right. Sub, uh, sub 4. Great. Okay. I'm keeping these together. How long? For how long? How long and with him? Uh, 10 minutes. Uh, it is 1020. We will be meeting for 10 minutes with yeah. council. And what is that? City manager, deputy city manager, staff will be joining us. Uh, to return at uh, 1031.
it is 1031 and we are requesting 10 more minutes uh, of executive session to return at 1041. Thank you.
It is 1040 and 49 seconds, and we will be requesting another five minutes uh, of executive session to return at 1046. Thank you.
It is 1046 and this meeting is officially adjourned. Thank you everyone. Have a great night.